We got a lot of welcome, welcome everybody. Yeah. Greg Peterson with the Urban Farm and Great American Seed Up. Welcome today. I'm here with Miss Janice and Belle and Kari and Bill. And uh, we're going to uh, bring you some amazing content today. We got a next slide here, Miss Janice. First, we Thank get to talk you. about who's here. Yeah, let's talk about who's here. All right. Who are we introducing yeah. first? Bell gets to introduce you. Oh, Perfect. yay team. Um, Gregor is co-founder of the Great American Seed Up. Many of you know him from his urban farm work online and physically. He had a site in Phoenix for 32 years, a third of an acre in the middle of the, a residential area. It was Phoenix's first environmental showcase for urban farming. He had a third of an acre, which uh, featured a primarily edible landscape, including 70 fruit trees. There was rainwater, gray water harvesting, solar, and extensive use of reclaimed and recycled building materials. This past April, Greg left us here in Arizona and moved to Asheville, North Carolina with his wonderful partner, Heidi, and he is immersing himself in a whole different climate. In oh his my. spare time, <laughs> yeah, really, I know. No rain, lots of rain. Yeah. Um, in his spare time, Greg is the host, there is no spare time. Um, Greg is the host of the Urban Farm Pet podcast that's released over 700 episodes with over 3 million listeners. Wow, Greg, that's awesome. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a consistency thing. I just, you know, you I just got to keep doing it. Stimulus, stimuli, stimulus, response. Cool. Janice, you're up next. Nope, Kari gets to introduce me. Oh, yeah, Kari that's gets me. To... I'm right, introducing cool. Janice. Okay. <laughs> All right, Janice is one of our, our partners and managers and Janice's expertise revolves around community and education. She has more than two decades of experience managing youth programs and training, both the with youth and their leaders. She has a great passion for helping others learn new skills. Wanting to take her own education further, she pursued degrees in chemistry and sustainability and snagged an inter internship with the Urban Farm. There, she became motivated to learn all she could about growing food while using her project management skills to help facilitate the Urban Farms events, including the second annual Great American Seed Up. And she was such an asset there. We, we were so great to meet her and she used her skills beautifully. Now that she's found her calling and knows she is making a difference in her community, there is no stopping her and she is she's wonderful we're so glad that that she's with us mm -hmm, for sure and and we're actually on our eighth annual great american seed up uh coming up this november so and bill is the co-founder of rocky mountain seed alliance in ketchum idaho and great um, co-founder of great american seed up he got his start in bioregional seed saving while in college in 1979, when he helped start Garden City Seeds in 1984, Bill started Seeds Trust High Altitude Gardens, a mail order company that he ran successfully until it sold in 2013. He also founded SeedSave.org, a website dedicated to seed education. He is the author of Basic Seed Saving. By the way, if you buy seeds today, I think that the seed saving book comes with them. Uh, a website dedicated to education. He authored, uh, authored the book Basic Seed Saving in 94 in 2010, and he and his wife, Belle, created Seed School, and we put it online in 2013. Um, Bill is passionate and knowledgeable and loves to inspire people about saving their own seeds. Thanks for being here, Bill. Thank you. It's an honor. My turn. And a, whole, I get, and a whole lot of fun. Yeah. My turn. I get to introduce Kari. Um, Kari, who I met at Phoenix College one day when she was presenting with uh, Greg in this seminar, uh, has been somebody I'm very much uh, admire and look up to. So I'm glad to introduce her. She is a popular local gardening and homesteading speaker. As a master gardener and a master farmer, she enjoys sharing her passion for growing and raising food with others. And this is evident in so much of what she does. 
In addition to teaching classes all over the city of Phoenix and online, she is the creator of Urban Farm U's Growing Food the Basics and Backyard Livestock courses. The first one is phenomenal and anybody who's growing food needs to take that one. Her book, City Farming, How to Guide to Growing Crops and Raising Livestock in Urban Spaces by 5M Publishing is a comprehensive but easy to read resource for any gardener or urban farmer. And she's also the author of her newest book, Vegetable Gardening, Logbook and Journal, published by Callisto Media. You can get both of those through the website at Great American Seed Up. Kari, I'm so glad to be working with you. Woohoo! And I get to introduce Belle as well. Belle is with seedsave.org and Cornville Seeds too, right now, Belle? Yeah. yeah. And is the co-founder co of Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance as well as the Great American Seed Up. Belle, along with her husband, Bill, developed the groundbreaking seed school, seed saving program, Seed School, which has graduated over a thousand people around the world. Belle has an extensive background in publicity and media relations, grant writing, and community organizing, and was a professional broadcaster uh, in Phoenix for a big part of the 30 years she was in it. Yeah. Phoenix and San Francisco. And... Nice. As one of our primary supporting team members, we want to do a shout out for Renee Foy. She takes care of our social media and she goes in and she packages most of our seed orders to get them in and out the door. Um, she jumped into the food growing scene in 2018 by way of a very random and curious email that she sent to the Urban Farm podcast team. Um, since that email, she's been completely immersed herself into food growing security personally, as well as vocationally, supporting projects with us at the Urban Farm and at the Great American Seed Up, and working at an educational development at the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. She enjoys doing her part in the cycle of growing food from seed, nurturing those plants, eating the bounty, sharing with her community, saving the seeds, and then repeating the process over and over again. So we love that Renee's in the background helping us. Amen to that. Nice. Are you gonna introduce these, Janice? I thought you would, but that's okay. Uh, right. Today on Saturday, Seed Up Saturday, we do have a lineup of topics. And the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna spend about 15 minutes on each topic. We're open up, we'll have a little presentation by each one of us, whoever's doing that particular topic. And then we're gonna go into the Q&A for that topic. So what we have done is we've opened up the Q&A aspect and you can find that anywhere on your screen, probably on the bottom, maybe on the right-hand side, depending on what your screen is set up. And you can put a question in there. Now, one of the new things we've found in Zoom is you as participants can upvote a question. So if you see a question that's exactly the same one that you wanna ask, upvote it. And then we'll try and answer those in that order. Um, we did make the chat room private so you can send messages to just us. This is gonna help us stay focused on the Q&A for our individual topics. So we're going to start off with how long do seeds last, then we'll jump into wildflowers, and then we'll do a couple back-to-back -back really good ones on grain gardening, and this is both specifically looking at what types of grains and stuff that you are going to be interested in. We're going to probably have a big, uh, a bigger, longer webinar on grain gardening coming up in the future. Uh, we're going to do global seed status, which is significant to what's happening in the world today. Big time. We'll do a quick seed up in the box intro for those of you who don't know who we are, or what we're doing or what the whole seed up in a box is. Uh, and then we're gonna have um, seeding, starting seeds smartly or we're gonna be talking about starting seeds and we're gonna have a little bit longer one on that one. We're gonna jump into seeds for extreme heat, which is important for most of us in the Southwest, but I'm thinking up in the other areas, you're having a heat change that's different for you guys as well. Um, uh, we'll do one on how to manage your seeds. And that's basically choosing which ones you're going to be doing and controlling your collection. And we'll have survival seed saving, uh, you know, prepping. What are you doing with that? And as always, we're very concerned about the logistics and the legalistics, I guess, of seeds. And so we're going to talk about the dangers of patenting. And we have some new bundles. So we're going to talk about those real quick. Awesome. 
and our sponsor. And so this is a program through Urban Farm U, uh, which uh, I own, Janice ma manages it, and uh, Great American Seed Up, uh, both Janice and I and the other three of us are partners in it, and we're sponsoring this uh, program today. Uh, you can find out more about the Great American Seed Up at greatamericanseedup.org. You can find uh, tickets for the in live in-person one in Phoenix, or uh, you can get uh, massive seed bundles, which we're going to tell you about here in a little while. Right. All right, Bill. I mean, Greg, yeah. are you ready? I'm not ready for this one, but we'll figure it out. Um, all right. The rest of us will stop our videos and mute and you can take over. All right. Well, don't leave me completely. Um, so how long do seeds last? That is a good question. And my answer, and maybe Bill can jump in and uh, think about this too, but my answer has always been uh, seeds last as long as you, until they last until you kill them. Um, pretty much, right, Bill? Yeah, it's yeah. pretty hard. And even then, it's hard. <laughs> Oh, it's even then it's hard to kill them. Exactly. Well, Lee, so how, how to not kill your, your seeds? Um, cool, dark, and dry. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. First of all, without local seeds, we can't have local food. So that is really my driver behind um, why to save seeds. We have to start creating our seeds so that they're more local. Um, and Many times, and this is a quote from uh, Cornell University, Petra Page Mann, she runs a small farm program there. She said, many seeds will maintain great germination for three years, even in your kitchen cupboard, though there are exceptions. Stored well, some seeds can last centuries. Reducing humidity is the key to storing seeds, reducing risk of mold and premature spouting, sprouting. Um, if you're saving homegrown seed, I love you. That's from her. I do too, but uh, uh, it's something that we all should be doing. In fact, I was at a friend of mine's yesterday here in Asheville, and she gave me a handful of, of uh, uh, flowers for Heidi uh, that were alive and a handful of flowers that were dried up. She said, take these home and put them in a bag. And um, they're flower seeds. And once they're completely dry, break them apart and you'll have your own seed forest to plant next year. So seed saving literally can be that easy. And when we look at this whole notion of expiring seeds, that is a function of the United States Department of Agriculture. Um, that is an instruction from them that the seeds need to be germination tested. That's germ tested for short. Uh, it's a process by which you test to see how many of them germinate. And I think the number on that one is every 15 months, right, Bill? Yeah. So every 15 months, uh, they're supposed to be germ tested. But once they get into that packet, uh, apparently nurseries and big box stores uh, can't sell them after they've expired, which is unfortunate. And I used to go to Home Depot in Phoenix. I had a collection route that I did periodically a couple uh, for a couple of years in a row where I'd make friends with the garden manager because uh, at the end of the garden season, when the seeds expire on the package, they bundle them up and yeah, you're going to hear me right here in a minute and they throw them away. That's just like, say what? So I used to go collect those and get them distributed to community gardens in Phoenix. So y'all might want to check and see uh, in your space, what is happening, uh, you know, with the, with the seeds that expire in packets. Um, doing a germination test. Let's talk real quickly about that, because this is how you can tell if your seeds are alive and ready to go. Um, you can do up to 100, but you put out a, a paper towel and you wet the paper towel, uh, and you can do up to 100. Uh, I usually suggest 20 or 25, and you just lay them out in a row strategically you know, maybe five per row for five rows and then roll it up and keep it damp for two to 10 days, depending on the germination time for the seed that you're germinating. 
And at the end of that time, you unroll it and you count the ones that germinated. So if you get um, 20 of 25 germinated, that's what, 80%, 80% germination rate. But here's the thing. If you get a 1% germination rate, you've got a plant to grow. And that's what Bill kind of referred to um, a moment ago is that even, even if you do try and kill your seeds, um, even if you get a one or two, one or two of them that germinate, you still got plants to grow and then save the seeds and make sure that you treat them well after that. Um, storing seeds is really important. My favorite place to store them is in a sealed container, cool, dark, and dry. Currently, I have five gallon buckets that with my seeds individually packaged in uh, plastic bags in those five gallon buckets that I keep sealed and I keep them in the house. Uh, for long-term saving of seeds, uh, if you want to put them in the freezer, you can do that, believe it or not. It does not kill them. You do not want to use the uh, air extraction machine that extracts all the air out of the sealers, whatever, don't ever use those. So basically what I do is I keep them in a Ziploc bag and put them in a jar, a glass jar, because glass jars don't seep uh, moisture, whereas plastic bags do. Keep them in a jar. When you take them out of the freezer for long-term storage, when you take them out of the freezer, take them out of the freezer and let them sit and get to room temperature before uh, before you open the jar. That way it doesn't suck in the uh, moisture in the air. Um, so there you go. Cool, dark, and dry. And, um, you know, keep them in a nice sealed waterproof container and like that. Yeah, Greg, I opened up a jar of seeds I had in the freezer the other uh -huh. day uh -huh. and um, set it out. And it was one of those high humidity days. We're having monsoons. And it was still wet on the outside uh, two hours later. I was just amazed at how long you have to wait. So yeah. just a warning there. Yeah, big time. So if you have any questions about uh, seeds and seeds dying, drop them in the Q&A. Uh, Darshan says, how much of these teachings are relevant for seeds in the tropics? Um, all of them? Uh, all of what we teach pretty much is relevant everywhere in the world, right, Bill? Right. There are some differences. If you try to save seeds in the tropic to carrots and celery, I'm thinking of some uh, beets and some of other root crops that are really popular to us here in the United States and are actually popular in tropical countries, especially uh, the Philippines. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, you will not have enough cold days for them to actually produce flowers, to, to go to seed. That's just a function of what goes on. So you might check on that. The term is vernalization. So you may have, at worst, what you'd have to do is put your carrots or your celery or whatever after you grow up for the year in a walk-in cooler or your refrigerator for a few months and cool it off and then bring it out and plant it, replant it. Um, Lots of these are biennials and then they'll go to seed. So that's one of the different major differences. Otherwise, almost all the principles for actual seed saving mm -hmm. um, are, are the same. Is that that's also called cold stratifying, is it not? Well, cold stratifying is when you do that to get a seed to germinate. Ah. Originally, vernalization is something that will um, trigger a plant to actually start flowering. So the plant's already germinated, whether it needed cold stratification or not, it's already growing in your garden. Yeah. I, you know, we had Filipino friends that were just frustrated because they could never get their carrots to flower. They go, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. And so um, it's, um, it's, it's a pretty simple thing. So day length has a, 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 an effect on things, how close you are to the equator mm -hmm. and lots of the tropics. So if you're trying to do onions, you'd want to look up and grow what we call short day onions. So there's lots of other kinds of differences, but so simple question, complicated answer, a few generalizations. And I think I just gave you those. Oh, there you go. All right. I think we're ready to move on to the next one, Janice.
Well, do you want me just to get started? We know what's coming up next. Yeah, let's do it. Can you not see the screen that says wildflowers? Sorry. I, oh yeah, there it is. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> wildflowers, Bill, take All it right. away. So I need to stop your screen sharing. There you go. And I need to get mine up. All right. Look okay? Yes, it does. All right. And let me know if uh, my sound has trouble, please. Um, so that's me sitting in the office for 28 years. I had a small seed company and about half my sales ended up being seeds for wild plants, either wildflowers or native grasses. And uh, this is becoming increasingly popular and I highly encourage people to uh, dive in, as you can say, I mean, see, I mean, what's worse than being in an office like that, right? <laughs> and so this was my little uh, seed company, High Altitude Gardens, that I ran for 28 years. And much to my surprise, I didn't start the company um, to do wild seeds. I started it to do vegetable seeds that were adapted to people that live in high cold places. And it was a pull from my customers. They wanted wild seeds. And I, for a while, I was confused. I, I couldn't figure out what was driving this huge change in American, you know, seed catalogs. And, uh, and I finally came to understand that um, almost everybody that was becoming a foodie, in other words, starting to uh, uh, pay attention to more local food, fresh food, or organic food, those sorts of things. All of those people realized that, you know, they're sitting in their kitchens now eating really, really good food, conscious food about how to live on the planet, maybe. And they're looking out their window and they've got a lawn, which is um, at one point, uh, most arguably the most poisonous place on the planet, the average American lawn. And they said, no, we don't want to do that anymore. That doesn't make sense. So we need to um, re-landscape our homes and be more conscious. And to do that, immediately we started thinking about wild plants, right? Because they're growing all around us. What would make more sense? And so, um, and it does make a lot of sense, but as people make that shift and they start thinking about using wildflowers in their gardens, I noticed a huge number of misconceptions that were carried into this enterprise that would keep people from being successful or, or cause them to waste huge amounts of money or time and energy. And so I'm just going to step through some of those misconceptions for you real quickly. One is that, um, you know, especially for new construction, um, that you can put your native landscape back. Many people started in the West, especially started with an empty lot and it had some sort of native or more naturalized landscape already on it. And so they thought, well, we'll just blade the whole thing. That's what your, your uh, excavator will tell you. And then I'll just put it back if I'm smart and I, I'm gonna put wild plants and wild seeds um, um, back and, and I'll, I will get down the road. And I, all I can say in a short period of time is it doesn't work. We don't know how to put it back. Some of the natural successions that take place um, uh, take a hundred years or more to put things back. You know, the soil has to evolve. The pioneer species have to come in. Only then can secondary plants start to establish self, themselves. And then the trees. It's not a matter of just putting all the seeds back. You have to have um, the soil conditions and the, the ecological conditions for them to be successful. And that happens in succession. And as I said, that can take 100 years. And out west, I think it could take two to 500 years. And so you'll never put it back. It'll never look like it did, no matter how much time, energy, and money you spend. Well, Bill, if I'm going to um, uh, re-landscape and use native seeds, I, I better bring in topsoil. I heard that over and over again, and I never saw this work. Almost all topsoil you bring in from the outside has weed seeds in it. This is an example near where I lived in Idaho, and you can see, and I was blamed for planting all those weeds. It was a yellow sweet clover and other things, and the seeds were not in what I planted there. They just came with the topsoil. Another thing I hear over and over is that biocides, I, oh, herbicides, Bill, how am I going to get rid of all the weeds or whatever on my property before I plant my wildflower seeds? I'm trying to be conscious here. Well, I can tell you after 
my 40 years experience. And part of that was being on the board of uh, pesticides.org for six years, which was a horrifying experience because I kept learning over and over what I'm about to tell you. There are no safe herbicides, none. There, all of them have some effect or some disruptive effect on your environment. And, and I know your pesticide applicator will say, oh, um, I read the uh, material safety data sheet and it says it's safe. Well, those material safety data sheets in the United States are paid for and developed by the people who make the pesticide. You can see on here, Dow AgroSciences. If you go outside the United States and read more objective um, safety data sheets, you will find all sorts of other information. And again, this can get scary. So don't think that you could use herbicides to help you with your transition to wildflower seeds. Um, it doesn't work. It disrupts your soil even further. And I would argue it's dangerous for your own health. Another thing I hear a lot is that, oh, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm buying all organic vegetable seeds. Now I'll just get organic wild seeds, wildflower and native grass seeds. And, and there are none. There are no commercially available organic wildflowers. If you buy them and commercially grown, um, they have been sprayed. I can say that almost without exception. Now, you know, never say never. Um, if they're hand crafted, wild crafted, somebody is actually gathering those wild seeds in and around your area, they still couldn't, may not be organic. The, forest, the United States Forest Service now and the BLM are two of the largest users of herbicides on our public lands without us even knowing it. And so just be aware of that, that the best thing to do is to find a way to collect a few of your own wildflower seeds and first maybe get them some from your neighbors or in your own neighborhoods where you know that things aren't being sprayed. And the reason why there are no organic seeds is that there are no noxious weed seeds allowed in the commercial sale of wildflower seeds. Zero. And so if there's any seeds or weed seeds in there at all, then uh, the whole lot has to be thrown out. And so no grower, commercial grower will take the risk. They'll just keep spraying herbicides. <clears throat> Your wild seeds will need little or no care. They're wild, aren't they, Bill? All I need to do is find the right ones, put them in your, my yard, and they'll take care of themselves forever. This one, that's almost um, exact verbiage of meadow in a can, oh, uh, a very successful mail order product that came out about 20 years ago. And nothing could be further from the truth. Wildflower seeds are wild because they're either too hard to grow and we haven't figured it out, or they're weedy and they take over your yard. And so just um, expect that you're going to have to pay attention to wild seeds and especially wildflowers in the same way you would bringing anything else into your garden. Do a little research, figure out whether it works, find a gardener next door who's already doing it and ask them about it. And I'll end with this, that because I heard this over and over is that, well, all I have to do to make this transition, to have the best landscape, the most conscious one, is to plant natives. And so I, I've, I heard this so many times with so many people that believe in it that I called it the church of the native. And everyone thinks it will save us. And I, nothing could be further from the truth. First of all, that's a picture of a lilac. And if you live in an area where they grow lilacs, those are not native to North America. You would have to send your lilacs home. And everyone I told that to said, oh, but I love my lilacs. They're not causing any problem. They've been in my yard for 40 years. My grandma planted them. They give me great joy. Why would I have to send those back? Well, exactly. Humanity has been all over the globe now since the hanging gardens of Babylon, learning what to use and what not to. We don't have to worry about things being noxious weeds um, in a lot of cases. We have a lot of data about that. And there's no reason then not to use plants from everywhere in your garden. And I'm a permaculturist. I'm building a new food forest around my house. And so I'm open and willing to try and use everything. I have to be smart. And it's nice knowing what's native. That's where I'm starting my project. I'm going to use everything native I can. But just remember, the church of the native isn't going to save you. All right. Well, I'm willing to take any kinds of questions. Excellent. It sounds to me. Oh, yeah, we got your uh, keyboard there yep. on your camera, Bill. 
sounds to me like people are more interested in listening than asking questions at this point. There are no current questions. So let's go ahead and jump into the next presentation. And I think that's you, Bill, on, <laughs> on grains. Well, I'm glad I got prepared for this. <laughs> now, is this on actual growing grains or grains? Yeah, a little bit. We did some grains the other night. I'm gonna, I've added a few things. I learned a lot from the questions the other night. So hopefully yeah. I'll get people further down the road. So let me share my nice. screen again. Nice, thank you. Okay. Rain gardening. You know, I had this thought this past week, Bill. Yeah. Um, grains are grasses. This yeah. is this this actually this is a conversation that has kind of developed and morphed since I got here because in order to hold up sides of mountains and yeah. berms and stuff here they plant grass right and the grass grew the grass along our road right out here grew to be five feet tall with a grain seed head on top of it and basically what they did is they scattered the seeds and walked away and the rain that showed up watered them and they produced more seeds. And it, it, as I watched that process, this is, this is one of the big reasons I love to do what I do, interviewing people and then going out and observing. As I watched it, it's like, hold on, grains are grasses <laughs> and it's easy to grow grass. Right. So, and, and I think it's easy to grow grains. I mean, I've never- They're grasses. Know. I've been gardening on my own since 1976, uh -huh. and I've never grown anything that was easier, more productive, uh -huh. more dependable, and gave me more color and joy, as well as food, than grains. Yeah. I, think, I think that's why they do provide 70% of the calories that humans eat. Wow. You know? You know, there's a reason for all of this. And we're just kind of, come, as modern creatures, we're kind of coming back around to it going, oh, Oh, I get it now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I have a hillside up this way mm -hmm. and uh, you and Bell are going to be visiting me soon. So you and I are going to walk that hillside and I'm going to say, all right, Bill, where are the grains going? Because yeah. I have, I, I want to get some grains planted. So, well, I'll bring some pocketfuls because that's uh, all you need to start. So. There you go. All right. And, cool. And to answer a question I saw um, on the thing, uh, September, October is a great time. To plant grains in almost all the countries. You really? Went, even, yeah. even here? Yeah, grow them through the winter. Oh, yeah. No, very you good. know, nice. you, as late as November, December, you know, and if you live in the southern tier, I planted mine in January last year. Wow. And st still got them. So, hey, that, guess what? It's grass. <laughs> grass is easy to grow. There you go. All right, take it away, Bill. All right. So, if you saw the uh, green gardening thing I did just the other night, um, forgive me, because I'm just going to tell this story again, because this is my big audacious goal. This is the new homeowner association. This is instead of a golf course, this is what you have at your homeowner association. And instead of um, paying your dues and going home to play golf on the weekend, it's Friday night. And instead of stopping at Planet Fitness, because you need some aerobics, you go home and you grab your scythe. And you get with your neighbors and you've been practicing and it's time to harvest. And on a little, on a way smaller plot than it would take to grow a golf course, um, you could have all the grain that your whole subdivision would need for the whole year. And it wouldn't take any more physical exercise than we're all using anyway, or even looking to use. And so this is Poland in 1938. And I can't imagine you know, a more beautiful square dance than to do this with your friends, to learn how to keep up and to do something so productive. And it's, look at how beautiful it is. So, so that's what I'm doing. I went home to grow grains and I grew 27 different kinds um, where I were uh, for a project I'll talk about in a minute, but to get a, more seed, to increase seeds. Turns out a lot of the old ancient and heritage grains that were successful in my part of the world and will be successful, we think, um, I can only get five grams of seeds at most, sometimes only 50. And that's okay, because grains are self-pollinating plants. All you have to do is save the seeds, and they rarely cross. And even if they do cross, it's easy to see that they have, and you could just rogue the things out later. So super easy plant to grow. Um, and if you don't have a grain to hug, 
in your backyard in the morning, then you're missing it. Let me tell you, I used to go down every morning and give my grains a hug. And that's a, a thousand year old variety of Tibetan purple barley there in front of me. And this is just, I wanted to show you just how beautiful. And this is, if you look at the trees early spring, I planted these, the, this field of grains in December and this was along about May, uh, late April, early May, before even the mesquite started to leaf out here in my home. And so I, it doesn't even interrupt my gardening. I harvest my grains. I start to plant uh, peppers and squash in and among them before I harvest. I harvest them. And then my other garden comes up in June, July, and August. And so um, it helps actually to cover my soil. And I just want to show you some of the diversity and beauty. Einkorn, 40% more protein than regular wheat. It's a simple, it's a wild grass. And there's a huge amount of diversity in it. The black and tan there on the left um, is one of the first free threshing einkorns we found. So it's just easy to grow. I thresh it and then I, uh, I can grind it and eat it. This is Toulouse Emmer. I grew this this year, this is an untouched photograph taken one morning with my iPhone. And it's like, say what? Why grow flowers? <laughs> when you can grow something that beautiful that then you can eat. And the Durham's, oh my gosh, the better known worldwide as semolina. This is pasta flour. I'm making my own pasta now. I've never had, of all the fresh flower movement things that I've been eating, which means that I'm grinding my, my uh, uh, wheat fresh just before I use it. Of all those things, I think pasta is my favorite. And this uh, bluebird durum, which originally came from the Fertile Crescent, we don't know how far, at least a thousand years ago. This is what it looks like in your yard just before it's ready to harvest. And so I've got my mock mill, which is a uh, uh, horizontal horizontal stone mill, one of the uh, lesser expensive ones, but a beautiful machine. Um, and it takes me about, I don't know, three or four minutes to grind up enough flour for my bread. Um, I've got my rock box, which is an actual stone oven. I've got mine hooked up to propane. You could use wood and I'm making pizzas. And we're going to do that for some, a garden club that's visiting soon. And uh, boy, once you do that, it's hard to go out. Those are the reasons to do it. One of the questions that always comes up uh, was answered by Dr. Ralph Bush. He teaches at the Air Force Academy. Um, he grows his own grains in his own backyard for his own bread and his own cookies. And Ralph told me that it takes about 100 square feet of grains. He can get seven loaves of bread. Seven loaves of bread. So I just want you to know that we can garden at home. And we should. And in fact, throughout most of the history of humanity, grains were grown in small scales in backyards, or at least on a community level. And that's the level I think that we need to get back, not only because supply lines are being disrupted worldwide, prices are going up. Price of bread just went up 50% uh, percent in New York City. Um, and there are times, and there were times during the pandemic when we couldn't get it. Um, and then mainly for our health. We can add back in fresh ground grains, which have more nutrition and more flavor to our diets if we, uh, if we have locally grown grains with, that are grown in soils with more nutrients. And we use the older ancient and heritage grains that have more proteins and more nutrition in them anyway. And if you have problems with your health, with gluten, if you've seen the gluten you know, section in your, in your grocery store, and if, if the gut problems have gotten you as they've hit a number of people in my neighborhood, including my wife. Um, Dr. Margaret Harris teaches at UC, UCCS, University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. She has um, gluten sensitivity, we'll call it. And so she's been on a mission to figure out what causes that. So if you wanna hear her talk and her conclusion that if you generally move back into the older heritage and ancient grades, and um, you use uh, traditional sourdough leavening, you may have less gut sensitivity to gluten. All right, there, I'm not talking gluten-free and I'm not talking celiacs, but if you want a scientist to talk 
about what we've experienced in our own home and why we're head over heels into our spelt and our einkorn and our emmer and our durham breads and pizza crust. Um, Dr. Margaret Harris can uh, uh, show you. And I will post that in the question and answers there in the chat anyway, the, the link so that you can watch her, her lecture at the university that she did for us. So Dr. Stephen Jones has one of the most famous um, uh, projects and moved back to where I think we should going. When people ask him how we're gonna scale up these heritage and ancient grains, he says, I think we should scale down. Um, to get started, how do we get started? There's uh, 400,000 different varieties of, of wheat. How are we going to sift through them and find the right ones for us? Well, he grew 10,000 varieties at the bread lab in order to find out what wheat will make the best bread for his valley, the Skagit Valley in Washington. So they grew 10,000 varieties all right next to each other. He's not worried about crossing, as I said before. And then they baked 900 little loaves of bread in order to taste it and figure out which ones were the best breads. That's how they're doing it on a large scale. That's what we all need to be doing where we are. Uh, it's easy to harvest. I got a sickle from Size Supply. Um, you can Google this up. This is an ancient thing. They're starting to make them in New England again, the way we used to. Real sharp tool, works really, really easy. I can do my whole yard probably in a couple hours if I set my mind to it. I usually go slower and I only harvest one a day, but this is all you need as far as equipment. Um, and then um, I stomp on my grains. I put them on a tarp and stomp on them. That's how I thresh them, get the seed away from the plant itself. And then I take what's left on the tarp, pour it through uh, a fan, like you see Casey O'Leary there with. And if you pour it straight down into that first box, the fan will blow away all the light chaff and you'll have clean grain in the bottom of your uh, bucket. It might take two or three times. It takes practice. This is, the, this is the culture of growing grain that we've lost. You can get machineries. You don't really need to. You know, a couple of screens might help. I ran my seed company actually cleaning all the seed for it for 28 years on a set of six cleaning screens. You can look around for those. Um, if you have questions about where to <clears throat> find those, you can put that in the chat. Uh, <clears throat> there are documents like the USDA has a document out for what was being grown in 1919. That's what we found. It's got all the names of all the grains in each state. We found those. We only got a few seeds. So we're trying to scale them up. We now have a network of almost 200 people that are helping us do this, telling us what works where they are, and then sending back to us twice as much seed as we sent them. That way we can send it out to other people. We call this the Heritage Grain Alliance. If you want to get involved, you can Google that up and find it and join our program or even get access to, there's about 60 different ancient heritage grains on it. So uh, you can actually get, you know, larger amounts of these grains so that you could uh, uh, experiment with eating them as well as growing them if you get our baker's bundle. So I think I'll end, see there. Um, end it Leanne. there. Leanne had asked, how do you learn how to harvest and prepare it for use? I guess you just you just went through that. Nailed it. Excellent. Ask, ask follow-up questions, more specific ones. Yeah. But really, it's easy. It's easy. People have been doing this all over the planet, you know, in a new book called Oceans of Grain. The author argues that that's why we have civilization and empires, is because people learned how to grow grains locally and learned wow. how to do it really well. And so, you know, we're kind of hitting the restart button these days on empires, right? Everybody's kind of building their own walls around their own little thing and we're not trading as much. And now supply lines are, are threatened, you know, maybe all it takes is one ship to get Caddy wow. in the Suez Canal, you know, so so people all over the world are coming home and learning how to, it's a, a start of a cycle. We've been through at least four times since 1600. And wow. we're just well, on and, that cycle again. And we're, you know, we're in the process of, of a mega drought in a lot of the country. Wow, and man. that's going to impact the food supply. So learning how to um, grow our own is even more important these days. I've got, for years, I've been um, talking about um, how barley is going to be threatened. It's only grown in about four states in the mm. Northwest. 
And uh, the climate's changing. That's what people who test yep. barley varieties told me. And at some point, something you know horrible is going to happen to it. Disease, a rainstorm that's not supposed to happen, whatever. And while I'm giving the lecture two weeks ago, Greg, some guy got his cell phone out and goes, Bill, it already happened. And he showed me how barley prices were up 35% because of the catastrophic weather event in the wow. Northwest. And so here it is. There you go. Uh, Susan wants to know what types of grains are good in Indiana in a mainly flower garden with minimal fruit bushes and even less vegetable growing. You know, pick your grain. I, um, uh, we have a place on our website, Heritage Grain Alliance, where you can download the USDA classification of grains 1919. So if you want to get an exact list, you could download, it's a free PDF now, look in the back, find Indiana, and they'll give you a list of everything that was being grown organically, right? 1919, and this is before chemicals, yep. and largely before any kind of sit and center pivot or large scale irrigation systems, drought tolerant. So if you want a place to start with modern wheats, that's where you do it. Otherwise, look through our list of grains we have available because now we have 200 people all over. You can see our directory where we do have people from the Midwest who've already tried the einkorns and emmers and some of the other grains and are telling us which ones work best. And generally, the 50 or 60 grains you'll find on our site are the ones that we found you mm -hmm. should probably start with. All right. Long answer, short answer. <laughs> That's Heritage Grains? HeritageGrains.org. Tell us a little bit about that, would you, while we're here? Well, we started, you know, at Native Seed Search, Bella and I, when we were directors there, got involved in a, a grant to uh, restart a local grain economy mm -hmm. in southern Arizona, it, which has been really successful. I could talk about that for hours. But we took the grain schools that we had started there um, into the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance when we started that. And one of the things that came out of one of the grain schools is that we need to do trials. We need to figure out which grains grow best where. So six years mm -hmm. ago, we started a trials program that um, continues to this day. Uh, Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance decided they no longer wanted that program. So now Leanne Hill and I, who started that program at Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance, have started our own organization called Heritage Grain Alliance. So nice. it's all the same thing, but we just were on a new website, have a new name. Cool. I am putting a link to the website Great. in the chat box. Awesome. And so we, awesome, um, awesome. so you can join our program and become a member for $50. And if you do that, we will work one-on-one -on -one with you. Leanne Hill, especially, who's been all over the world doing this and working with all of our growers. And she can help you dial into Indiana or wherever you are for what you need and want and what we know will work there. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to do that and you just want to get started on a small level, you can get individual packets of grain for $5.95 off our site. You can order them up and I'll ship them out next Friday. And nice. those that $5.95 just helps us cover the cost. of It doesn't cover the cost, but it helps us cover the cost of doing what we're doing so or if you want to super or, energize, or if you want to super energize get a lot of seed share it with your friends make some bread from it maybe um you can uh get our baker's bundle at great american seed up as well that's actually the cheapest place i've never seen a place where you can buy einkorn white sonora emmer red fife and spelt all in one place and all you can there. do that with our green bundles so there you go there you go. Uh, Lauren wants to know what is Bill's favorite grain mixes for breads and pizzas? Ooh, you know, I had to decide that this morning again. Um, yeah. I love the flavor of the ancient grains, the einkorns and the emmers. Um, however, I love the baking quality of spelt. Mm -hmm. Spelt has the baking quality of the modern grains. It's more like making regular bread, but it has the flavor and nutrition of the ancient grains. It's a nice mix. And so my favorite mix now, I did uh, a third einkorn, a third spelt, and a third red fife to make my pizza this morning. Wow. It, it'll change to next week, but that's where I am right now. Nice. 
And uh, Leanne and then, and then Janice, we're gonna jump into the next uh, presentation um, after this question. Leanne says, can you explain the fan process again? Yeah, it's called winnowing. It is as old as humanity. You see, we see, got pictures of Indians at the Taos Pueblo pouring baskets of seed in the afternoon when the wind blew through. Wow. The idea is that the seeds are heavier mm -hmm. and that if there's any moving air at all, it will blow the chaff off to the side. So whatever variation of that you can have. So that's where that fan sitting up high with a box underneath it in front of it comes in. So you, you stand up there and you pour your whole mix of st plant stuff that's got the seeds in it down into that box through moving air. And the air will move all the chaff off and the seeds will land. And sometimes the fan's too strong and it blows it all off. Sometimes it's not strong enough and you have a lot of chaff in it. But again, that's the craft of learning to be a, a, a seed saver and uh, just practice. And after a little while, you'll be able to do it. We had a Somali woman who did it in a basket. She just yeah. had a big, she would throw it up in the air and the wind would blow the chaff off. That's been done for thousands of years also. So you know however you do? want to do it. You know what I've done in the past with uh, a strainer? Just a, you know, yeah. like a spaghetti strainer. Yeah. I right. do that and literally I blow. Yeah, there you throw go. Throw it up and just, you know. There you go. If yeah. you want my latest advanced technique, get a squirrel cage fan. Oh, I don't know what that is. Well, that's the kind of fan that is in most air conditioning units and other things. And it's a, it's a, it looks like a squirrel cage and, if, and then the air comes out the bottom in a, in a thing. You can ask for it. Oh, Maybe. interesting. All right. Yeah. But they, it works better. As all, I, that was something that Farmer John from Sustainable Seed taught me. Cool, cool, cool. All right, Miss Janice. Hey, I'm jumping in here because we're about ready to um, step into Kari's time. So I know this is a cool. very popular topic in a lot of ways, but we've talked about making a larger class specifically going into growing grains and tips. So we'll have to tell all our friends to come back for that one. Yeah. Yeah, I really, I would really be interested in that myself, especially when Greg starts talking about pizza. <laughs> uh, right? <laughs> yeah. And I'm encouraged by how Bill says it's one of the easiest things to get started on. So I'm ready. I'm ready. Amen to that. All right. I'm going to share it for a moment here. We're going to do global seed status. It's Kari Spencer. Take it away. All right, so I'm going to share my screen. And let's see, share. All right, um, can you see this? Am I actually sharing my screen? Yep. We are <laughs> seeing your screen, screen. but All we're right, seeing your version. We need you to present it. Right, and now the top of my Zoom screen is covering it up what I need to click to. Up in the top, there's a little uh, fourth icon, the one next to go up. Up in the top, there's icons. You can't see it? No, no, because it's it's covered. All right, well, just. Well, maybe... give. I don't know. Under slideshow, can you see the word slideshow? Hmm. Let me. How do I stop sharing? Okay. Well, just go this ahead is, and just go ahead and. I'll present. just go ahead. Yep. Yeah, because I'm. Yeah. Clearly, I'm technically challenged. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk to you about this global grain update. We titled it "Global Seed Update," but grains are seeds, and you know, seeds in general. Are, are, you know, we're feeling the pinch on, on grains, seeds, food, it's all connected, right? It really is. So, but what's going on in this world of grains? So one of the things that we're seeing in the news that I think everybody 
is pretty much aware of is the Russia and Ukraine conflict, the war that's going on there, which has severely pinched the uh, world supply of grain and, and as well as cooking oil because sun, sunflower oil comes out of Ukraine. And that is happening for a, a lot of reasons. And, you know, some of the top reasons are loss of land. And there is also hesit hesitancy to ensure shipment. So people that um, transport grains, you know, they, they have to insure those shipments and, you know, the insurance companies are, are hesitant to insure those. And there are, uh, there have been blockades on trade routes, but uh, I will give you some good news there in just a few moments. Um, another thing that's happening in the world, partly related to the war in Ukraine, is that global hunger is on the rise. According to the United Nations World Food Program, hunger has increased from 135 million people who were acutely food insecure a, a few years ago to 345 million in 2022. And that's an astounding jump in the number of people. And of those 50 million are edging on, fam on famine. And Ukrainian grain is particularly and vital to millions of people. And many of those are in Africa, parts of the Middle East, the Middle East and, and South Asia. And they were already facing food shortages before the war. And now the, you know, that situation is getting worse. And if you look at the map, unfortunately, my little box here covered some of the color coding, but the yellow and orange, those are the areas that are worst off in the world as far as famine goes. Now in the United States, fortunately, um, we are not facing as dire situation as many parts of the world, but we do have our challenges and what challenges the US also affects the rest of the world. And here in the United States, farmers are facing very high prices for their supplies. A lot of fertilizer comes out of Russia. And uh, so there is short supply for fertilizers. And as we know, many of the industrial farmers in the United States still use a lot of the um, petroleum-based fertilizers. And those have become very high priced. Um, seed and other agricultural pro products have also gone up very much in price. They've gone up as much as uh, four times while the price that they're getting in return for their grains has, has roughly doubled. So they're paying four times as much for their, the things they need to grow the, the grains and they're getting twice as much um, as a return. So, you know, they're paying quite a bit more than, than they're seeing in their, their returns. And our food, according to the United States Food Price Index, food prices have risen on average 10.4% this year compared to last year, which is a significant increase and they're expecting them to rise even more by next year. Fortunately, we're seeing fuel prices coming back down, which will affect freight prices, which could help that situation a bit. Now, there are some good news. A deal was signed in July uh, to lift the blockade in the Black Sea so that there is now a humanitarian, humanitarian corridor by which products can be shipped out of the Ukraine um, through Istanbul, Turkey to the rest of the world. And the first grain shipment actually left Ukraine on August 1st and the first humanitarian shipment going to Ethiopia left on August 16th. Um, that was shipped by the United Nations World Food Program. So there is some hope on the horizon to be able to get products out of the Ukraine to places that, that need them. Now, uh, going back to the United States, the winter wheat yield has not been, it was originally 
the uh, forecast for our winter wheat yield, which um, I would just back up and say that winter wheat is harvested in the summertime. So sometimes that can be a little bit confusing. It's planted in the winter, but harvested in the summer. The yields were, there were some dire predictions coming out about that. Fortunately, things were not as bad as we thought they were gonna be. Although across the, the Southern Plains, there still was significant drought this summer up in the Northwest that Bill was talking about during his presentation. We did get some, some good rains and so their uh, harvests were pretty good. And also up in Canada, their harvests were pretty good. So things were a little bit better than as they were as expected thus far. All right, and when grain shortages, when there are grain shortages, there are seed shortages because grains are seeds. So sourcing grains for planting can be challenging and prices for grains as well as other garden seeds have risen. So one of the best things that we can do to help the situation and make a difference is to focus on saving and sharing seeds. Okay, so food shortages tend to, tend to trigger a rush to buy seeds, which we did see back at uh, the beginning of the year and through the spring. And people were, were trying to get seeds and finding that seeds were scarce and the prices were really high. So one of the best things that as gardeners that we can do is to, as we're growing food, we can collect our own seed, save those seeds and share them with other people and teach other people how to do that. And uh, really encourage people to grow some grains. As we talked about with Bill, I'm really motivated to do that. So I'm excited to learn from Bill how to do that. And also you can grow some alternatives to wheat. Greg actually showed our team a, an article about growing alternatives to wheat. And I put the link here because I thought it was really fascinating. So if you wanna take a look at that, um, I shortened the link because it was really long, but you can go to tinyurl.com slash ancient crops if you want to see that article. And I also, of course, encourage giving to organizations that help people who are experiencing food insecurity locally as well as globally. And if you want to see a, um, a, an entire article that I wrote with a lot more detail on this subject, on what's happening in the world, as well as more good news and more things that you can do, if you go to our blog at greatamericanseedup.org slash blog, there's a lot more detailed information there. It's the very first article because it's the last article that I wrote. So you'll be able to get to it very quickly. Also, I want to mention that at the very beginning of Bill's presentation, he talked about um, instead of on Friday night, uh, getting off of work and going to the driving range and hitting a few balls, you know, going home and getting your your equipment out and you know cutting some wheat. I in the blog I put some links to some people who are actually doing things just like that. And there's one in particular up in uh, Sarasota County in New York, a a um, group of people who have a little um, community garden where they are they're actually growing some wheat together and there's a whole article about it that I think uh, you might find interesting so I hope that you will all take a look and I will pause sharing my screen and some awesome I uh, I put that tiny URL into the uh, chat box Right. I think Janice was going to jump on. There you are. I am. I am. Um, so we're going to look at the questions that we have coming in. And um, some of them are a little out there, not exactly on the seed status, but there's some of them are. Uh, Jen asks, is it still illegal for corn or soy farmers to save seeds, like from Monsanto? 
Um, is grain and seed saving happening on any large scale for farmers outside of this? Okay, so that's two questions. The first one, I know that Bill is going to be talking about seed patenting later. So I might defer that question, question to him. him. I do know that in some cases, yes, but maybe, you know, he, he he's going to give you a better answer on that. And what was the second question about large scale? Is seed saving happening on any large scale for farmers outside of this? You know, I don't know the answer to that question, but uh, Bill and Bell might might know more because they're more in touch with the with the world of farmers than I am. You know, the, the, the traditional uh, method for growing grain in rural areas was that um, at least, you know, from World War II on uh, was for farmers to uh, harvest their grain and take it to their local elevator, they called it. It was a seed cleaning and processing facility. Everybody didn't have their own. They would take it down to a, a local one. And, and the folks there would um, clean the seed, um, in some cases size it, they'd send it through screens and keep out only the larger grains and set those aside and then um, bag those up and store them for that farmer so that they could have their seed to plant that next year. So seed saving was built into the system. What's happened is that large companies, especially chemical companies have come in, bought up all these small regional elevators so the farmers now have to be bigger and take their grains farther away. And the, they don't provide that service. In fact, most of, many of those elevators now don't sell a seed that you could do that with anyway. And this answers part of your other question. Those seeds are what they call protected. Not necessarily patented, but they have some sort of contractual agreement linked to them or they've been uh, protected in the Plant Variety Protection Act. And what that does is it, the elevator will then tell those farmers, no, those seeds are protected. You can't have them back. You have to buy new seed next year. And of course, this process is, you know, up seed sales for everyone, but it's taken the local seed saving out of it. Now, it doesn't mean it's stopped. And there are small regional elevators that still do this. But so it's, Bill, uh, let me yeah. let me ask you a question. Sure. So in Arizona, we have some great grain growers that are organic growers, for example, BKW in Marana and R&D, right. grain R&D in Queen Creek, where we right. get the purple bar barley. Right. And those guys are just saving their seed, right? right. They're, they're not, they, I mean, because yeah. they're small scale operators. So I'm assuming that that's happening throughout the country in on smaller levels. And that, you know, you have to kind of check around and ask questions and, and find those local farmers, but it's, it's growing. Right. But those guys, I would say. thank you for clarifying. What I was trying to say is that 30 years ago, they would have had a facility locally where they could have taken their grain down and gotten it cleaned and bagged for them. And they would have saved seed out for them, but those facilities don't exist anymore. We lost that whole sort of small uh, or medium size processing. And so now they're getting started again and they had to do their own. People are, we're having to, this is part of that cycle again. We're starting to reinvent what we had to, on a smaller scale. Nice. That's important. That's important. Yeah. And I'm glad that we're seeing regional connections being made again, because that's important for our seed status that Kari has been talking about. So, you know, effectively in this, in her presentation that we are, we cannot uh, eliminate the, I mean, we can't, I'm thinking of, can't think of the word, but the importance of our connections locally are going to make a global impact. Right. Thank Amen you, Gary. You know, 40 years ago, uh, somebody could have argued that that was a stupid idea to go regional, that we could do grain much cheaper for more people if we just made it really big, the economic, and then we could export it to the world. That's what we did. And, but you have to realize we weren't thinking about climate change and our relationship to the environment at that point. And we weren't thinking about the health effects of that, that the no. wheat that we ended up with, which is 95% of the wheat grown in this country is actually making many people sick now. So that now we're all going, oh, 
oh, we better come back to smaller regional. We can bring more diversity and more healthy grains into it. it makes more sense environmentally, right? Because we can tune and, 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 and check on the resources that we're using. We can use drought tolerant varieties. So we use less resources overall. So that's kind of how I see the big picture evolving. So today's class in grains is just part of that. Bring that down into your own home. You know, find out what works where you are and you'll help all of us rediscover so that we can have the abundance that grain brings us, but we don't have to worry about it either making us sick, causing environmental damage or uh, worry about not being able to get it at all. And right. then that. So um, go ahead, Janice. I was just gonna say that um, to stay on time, it's time yep. for our next video. <laughs> That's where I was going too. <laughs> We're so, trying to go ahead. We, we put together bundles of seeds, and that's what the video is about, isn't it, Janice? Yeah, you know, with the Great American Seed Up organization, we started out all about education and making uh, seeds available in bulk to help this idea of uh, seed banks across the Valley of Phoenix. Well, we needed to trans. We had needed to change gears a little bit, and we have a little video to explain that. Uh, fortunately, we have a friend named Stevie who helped make this video really polished. So, join us if you've already the, seen it. And and the shift came in because we were doing the Great American Seed Up in person in Phoenix, and the shift came in in 2020 when we had to figure out how to make these bundles available for people uh, inside of the scope of what was going down with the pandemic so right right this has been a definite team effort so here is our little video can you hear it no can't no. hear. no i'm going to stop and start over again yeah there's Share a sound. should be yeah a button for sound yep i just didn't hit it Hi, I'm Janice Norton, part of the Great American Seed Up team. We are dedicated to making a difference in our gardening communities across the nation and as far out as we can reach. What we've created is Seed Up in the Box. 25 varieties of seeds in one package. 250 generously sized, non-GMO, heirloom adapted seeds that you can share with your community, with your neighbors, with your fellow gardeners, enough vegetables to take care of yourself and 10 families, that can happen with Seed Up in a Box. What we originally created was the Great American Seed Up, an opportunity for our gardeners to come and get seeds and scoop at a time. But that wasn't exactly going to work when the coronavirus hit us. So we expanded and we created something new. By doing so, it became available to people across the United States. When you order an essential, a basic, a banquet bundle, what you're getting is 25 varieties of seeds portioned out so that you can divide them up for your 10 friends. What happens is you get a single bag of a variety. With each variety, we have a suggested scoop size and we pack 10 of those scoops into one bag. You're gonna then divvy up that bag into level servings and you can put them in the plastic bags that we provide and insert one of these cards so that everyone knows what they're getting. However, if you'd like to go with the non-plastic option, you can choose a bundle that does not have all of this extra plastic and we'll throw in an extra variety of seeds for you instead. What happens when you have these 25 seeds in your possession and you divide them up into the portions that we've suggested, you have 250 servings of heirloom, non-GMO seeds that are perfect for gardens across the United States. The magic of the Seed Up in the Box is accessible to you through our website at greatamericanseedup.org. When you go online, you can choose a bundle and you can see which seeds are in those particular bundles. There's 25 varieties in the basic the essential and the banquet bundles. There are 75 varieties in the ultimate bundle. Then if you want to pick up your own selection, you can do the mix and match bundle. 
where you can choose which seeds you want to put in there. We will put together your bundle when your order comes and then we will ship it to you priority mail. When you get your seed up in a box and you open up this bounty of seeds, you will be amazed at what is inside. Now, our varieties change a little bit from season to season because we are shopping to find the best deals available for you. We wanna make sure that we have good quality seeds, non-GMO, heirloom adapted. We want you to be able to get the best deal possible. That's why we do bulk seeds your way. From our beans, to our cabbage, to our pollinators, we have a lot of options that you can use in your garden. Several different varieties of vegetables. We have cover crops, we have grains, wheats, we have pollinators, a variety of different flowers. Some of them are even edible. We have the basics that you can use to start your garden. We have what you need. Basic seed saving is the resource that we put inside our primary bundles. If you choose to do a mix and match, be sure to add your basic seed saving yourself. And we have other books in our library to choose from. including a journal by our own Kari Spencer. Now I wanted to ask Kari Spencer some of her thoughts on what is in the Seed Up in a Box bundle. It really is something that we find hard to explain when people ask us. Right. And so we decided to um, go ahead and just spread it all out on the table so you could actually see what was in the box. And we also send along some information and education, education so that people can know how to plant and grow each of the different varieties. I like to keep some around just to give out to friends. Somebody comes over, sees my garden, they're like, oh, that's really cool. Well, here, you can do this. Yeah. Here's some seed. <laughs> here, taste this vegetable and some seeds. Now you can get your own. This is an example of the carrot seed in our basic bundle. This particular carrot is the red cord chantenay. You would get 10 times this amount in a seed up in a box. And when you divide it up, each person will get a card and that size scoop of carrot seeds. And when you get the seeds and you divvy them up amongst 10 people, right? then every person gets a portion like this. What happens from there is wherever your imagination takes you. And the process is ongoing because the more seeds you have, the more vegetables you have. We're going to teach you how to do that with Great American Seed Up and the education, which is part of the Seed Up in a Box. We're going to help you create your own magic. What if I don't need 10 servings? Well, our favorite answer is share them. For suggestions on this, you can check out our blog article, urbanfarm.org slash share seeds. Do the seeds work for my area? Well, we've chosen seeds that should work across the United States. The key is to check your individual planting zones and climates to determine the best planting time. Some varieties may need indoor or greenhouse care, but the key is adaptation by growing your own seeds. Are the seeds GMO free? Well, yes. We only source non-hybridized and non-GMO seeds. All right. Excellent, excellent. Good job, Janice. We'll, uh, I'll uh, fix the video on, or the audio on that. We need to crank it up a little bit. Much appreciated. You know, with us, with our bundles, we sit down as a group and we talk about what we can do. And um, what was it, about five, six months ago, we decided to create a- Kari is a popular Oops. local gardening and homestead. Oh. Did I start that one already? Yeah, but not yet. Uh, you're, talking <laughs> about, you're talking about the uh, Baker's Bundle. I'm talking about the Baker's Bundle, right? Um, we do have a the new mini bundle. It's mini because it doesn't have a lot of uh, varieties. Um, but it has uh, the seven varieties. Car, you did a great job on this on this picture and this graphic. Thanks. 
Yeah, it's really nice. Yeah. And you did yeah. a great job too, Janice, with that whole presentation. I especially like the music. <laughs> I think the music right. is hard. the schmaltzy music just powers it, man. I'm just like, I was like grooving. <laughs> yeah. Many Love thanks it. to our friend Stevie who put that yeah. together. We um we were trying to find an, a way to explain where our idea came from and what's in a seat up in a box. Because so, we have we have two things. We have the Great American Seat Up, which is our live event in Phoenix, where you can come and scoop your individual scoops of seeds. And then because we couldn't do that, we created the online version, which is seed up in a box. So and the the spread that you had on the table, that oh was gosh. a basic bundle. That was a that's correct, a bundle. Up, correct. A, 25 different varieties that were divided up into individual servings. So one of the ways we did this, because we're not in the seed packet business, we were talking about this as a group and we came up with this idea to put 10 packets worth of our size packets in one bag and let our customers do the divvying up themselves so they can save money. Janice, when you had the red cord chantenay on the table, by the way, my video is locked. So, oops, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Um, you had one portion on the table, correct? Correct. Yes. Oh my gosh. Oh my frigging gosh. That's, that's, and so that we do 10 times that amount in a in portion, a ten pack. in yeah. the 10 pack. In our, so, in our 10 right. portion bag is right. 10 right. of those scoops will and arrive think, in one bundle. We figured well, our, it our, in, our intent, sorry, Bell, our intent with the scoop size was to target having 10 times what you would get in a normal packet. Right. And it or, averages out to about 72 cents or something per packet. Right, seven, 72 cents a packet. A big, broad sweep. Yeah. It changes with the bundles because we're our right. varieties are changing season to season. Um, I'm adjusting that in the background. If, we, if we've run low on one variety, we'll, as a group, we'll figure something else out and we might have to change it a little bit. So the per scoop, is around around that price. Nice. Unbelievable. Yeah. Nice. Cool. Well, thank Good you stuff. for that, Janice. Thank you. Well, we are fortunate enough. Um, Kari's asked us to be able to show a video from last time for starting seeds. And because this was a very popular video that our mm -hmm. topic. So we're going to have a little quick video on starting seeds. Thank you, Kari. And um, you can put your questions in the Q&A and Kari will be answering them there. Um, although we might save a couple for the actual presentation. Cool. So let me stop that. Can you, nope. You can't hear it, can you? Nope, not yet. And there we go. Maybe. Kari is a popular local gardening and homesteading speaker here in Phoenix. As a master gardener and a master farmer, she enjoys sharing her passion for growing and raising food with others. In addition to teaching classes all over the city of Phoenix, she is the creator of the Urban Farm Muse Growing Food the Basics and Backyard Livestock courses. Her book, City Farming, How to, The How-To Guide to Growing Crops and Raising Livestock in Urban Spaces is a comprehensive yet easy to read resource for any gardener or urban farmer. Her latest book is The Vegetable Gardening Journal. Take it away, Kari. I'm so happy to be here talking about growing transplants from seed. It's one of my favorite things to do. And there are so many benefits to doing it. I'm going to be talking pretty quickly today because we only have 15 to 20 minutes to get through this material. But I will be, um, I have written down notes for you that you can get at this link. And don't worry if you don't catch it now. I'm going to uh, show this again at the end of the presentation. All right, why do I love seeds so much? Well, they're really inexpensive and sowing seeds is very easy whether you direct sow them in your garden or you create transplants like we're talking about today. Plants grown from seed are very well adapted to your climate where you 
live and to the growing conditions in your yard. Um, you also know exactly how that seed was propagated and it preserves genetic diversity because you can grow so many different types of plants from seed, many more than from transplants that you purchase at a nursery. And saving seeds year after year makes your garden stronger. So we're gonna talk about starting seeds in containers. And in transplant containers, we wanna start seeds that need a, a long growing season. So we wanna give them a head start growing them indoors before we plant them out in the spring. And this is also true for plants that require specific temperatures. And I'll give you the example for me here in Phoenix, tomatoes need a really specific temperature to, to uh, start growing flowers. And I cannot grow from seed directly in the garden because it's too cold. So if I wait till springtime to plant my seeds, by the time they're big enough to set flowers, the temperatures will be too high. So I start them in advance indoors. Start seeds in sterile seed trays with a seed starting mix. Okay, why do I say sterile seed trays and a seed starting mix? It's very specific. Well, because there are fungi that will attack little seedlings and, and kill them. We call that damping off and we're gonna talk more about that in the next few slides. Also seed starting mixes tend to be sterile and they contain ingredients that fungus doesn't really like to grow in. And so if you open a fresh bag of seed starting mix, you know that you're going to be pathogen free and you're, it'll, it'll really help your seedlings to grow in a healthy manner. And we're gonna start seeds in containers that um, need to be indoors or under some protection. So sometimes people ask me, when do you start your seeds indoors? Well, you can check your local planting calendar to discover recommended planting dates. So wherever you live, Google the planting calendar and that will help you out to figure out when you need to get your seeds started. And if it's not easy to determine the starting date for the seeds that you wanna grow, then you can ask an experienced gardener if you know somebody who who does this um, makes their own transplants just ask them or you can consult your local nursery uh, sometimes you can just google it and find out or you can call your local master gardener hotline and they'll help you out uh, you can go to ahsgardening.org and look at their gardening resources and there's a list of master gardener programs and you can give them a call or you can simply Google master gardener in whatever area in which you live. Okay, so how do we start our seeds? We wanna start them with fresh, sterile seed starting mix, which we already talked about. So you open the bag of your seed starting mix and you wanna moisten your soil starting medium. Sometimes it can take a little bit of time for these media, media to absorb water. So you'll put some water on it and let it sit for a while. If you still feel dry spots, add some more water. Additionally, if you want to make your own seed starting mix, you can do that. And there are lots of recipes that you can find online. Okay, once you have your seed starting mix and it's moist, grab your trays and fill your trays almost to the top. 
We want to make sure that the soil is just below the surface of the edge of the tray. That way you have plenty of airflow around your little seedlings as they start to come up. And that will help to prevent the damping off problem that I mentioned before. Once you have your seed trays filled almost to the top, then you want to firm the soil. Don't smash it into the tray, but just firm it down. Pay attention to the corners and the edges because if the soil in the corners and edges is not firmed in really well, then it will sink when you water and the seeds can slide in to those low spots. You want to plant two to three seeds per cell or if you're just planting them all in one big tray that doesn't have separate cells, then you just want to space them a few inches apart. Plant very small seeds right on the top of the soil and cover them with a sprinkle of vermiculite or just a little more of your soil starting mix. If the seeds are larger, like bean seeds, pea seeds, then you want to push those down into the soil a little bit further. Now, to get a seed to germinate, it has to absorb water. So you'll need to keep an even moisture level in your seed starting trays. If seeds start to absorb, absorb moisture and then they're allowed to dry out, that can really undermine the process of, of starting those seeds. So try to keep the soil about as moist as a wrung out sponge. If you're watering from the surface, then just use a gentle mist. But my preference is to water from the bottom. So you can put your seed starting trays into another container that holds water and let them absorb as much water as they can, let them saturate, and then take them out of the water and let them drain and dry out a little bit before you repeat that process. Don't keep the soil soaking wet all the time or that will encourage damping off. It just needs to be um, a little bit wet. Seeds tend to need specific temperatures in order to germinate. And those temperatures can vary, but they're typically around 78 degrees Fahrenheit. Consult your seed packets or Google online to see what temperatures um, are best for the seeds that you're growing. Place your plants in a bright south facing window or a few inches below a grow light for 16 hours a day. If you don't have a bright south facing window, you might need to grow them in a window on the west side or the east side with a, with a grow light added. Um, and if you're growing in a north facing window, you definitely need to get some more light in there. I haven't found that growing just with grow lights works very well. So some natural sunlight is recommended. You can add some reflection in order to increase the intensity of the sunlight and the warmth that your plants receive. Uh, in this picture here, you can see that these are there are mylar sheets placed behind the seed start the seed trays. And you can do that with mylar, you can do that with foil, you can do that with mirrors. So now in this photo example, there's light coming in through the window, going past the seeds, and then it's being bounced back by the reflective material so that essentially the seeds and seedlings are getting that light twice. <laughs> and then keep your containers warm to prevent damping off. If it's cold and a draft is coming in through those 
windows, you might want to put your seed trays on a warming mat, which is like a heating pad for seeds, but it doesn't get hot enough to, to burn the seeds like a heating pad can. So um, those are available online or pretty much at any nursery or at the big box stores. When your seedlings start to sprout, you'll notice that um, they usually start with one or two leaves. Those are the seed leaves. As soon as they start to sprout, they're uh, regular leaves that look like <laughs> that look like you think the plant should then you can start to thin. So make sure they have four or five leaves before you do this. Um, I usually use cuticle scissors and I'll take out uh, the plants that look the weakest and leave the strongest. I cut them at soil level and then if I have enough of them, I will throw them into a salad or on a sandwich because greens are really healthy for you. Um, you know, the reason I haven't mentioned fertilizing when you plant seeds is because the seed actually contains the nutrients that the little plants need as they start to sprout. And it's a really concentrated form of nutrient. And it, so those sprouts contain that concentrated form of nutrient and they're really good for you. Once your plants are starting to grow and you've thinned them, then you can start to fertilize just a little bit with an organic fertilizer, a balanced fertilizer, uh, but don't overdo it because they are babies and they don't need a full dose of fertilizer yet and you don't want to burn them. Avoid pulling on the seedlings to remove them because the roots tend to be tangled and if you do that, then uh, you will likely pull all three of the plants out rather than leaving the healthiest one behind. When your transplants have grown enough root matter to hold the soil together, it's time to transfer them to the garden. Uh, you know, may, uh, with the caveat that it has to be the right temperatures outside to do so. You wanna make sure that the danger of frost has passed. And you also wanna make sure that you take your transplants in the transplant containers and put them outside for a while to harden off before you dig your holes and plant them in the garden. Hardening off just means that you're acclimating them to the outdoor environment because they've been indoors, they haven't experienced wind, they haven't experienced direct sunlight. It's always been through a window, right? They haven't experienced fluctuations in temperature like they do outside. And, you know, there's just so many differences between being indoors and outdoors. So what I like to do is just take my seed trays outside, let my transplant sit outside for a few hours and then bring them in. And I'll do that for a couple days. And then I'll just take them out and leave them outside for a couple of days, keeping an eye on them to make sure that they're doing okay. If, if you know, it's gonna rain or if the weather, um, seems like it's going to be extreme, whether there's a frost coming or what have you, then I might cover them, but I'm gonna leave them outside. And then after they've had a couple days outside, then I'll go ahead and plant them. That way they're not stressed all in one day by being taken outside and removed from the transplant containers and put in the ground. They are able to adjust gradually. Okay, I have some resources for you because this has been a short introductory class. We can, there's always more to learn about growing transplants. 
So if you go to greatamericancdep.org, we always have um, classes going on that you can become be a part of. Uh, I would highly recommend Seed School online as well if you want to get a really in-depth seed education. My book, City Farming Book, also has information about starting plants from seed, and there is information on my website as well. Uh, you'll also want to go to that bit.ly link, Growing from Seed, to get the um, information that uh, I have written down for you. And I do want to encourage you to get information from several different sources and particularly from people in your local area who will have the best, um, probably the best advice for where you live. And I encourage you to just get started doing it and don't be discouraged. If you experience damping off and your little seedlings die on you, that's normal. It happens, it happens even to experienced gardeners. Once in a while, that fungus just gets in there and devastates um, a seed tray. And you know, seeds are not very expensive. So if that happens, you're gonna know it pretty quickly. So just start over and don't be discouraged. It's a learning experience for for all of us. And the more that you do it, the better you will become. And I really think that it is highly worthwhile to create your own transplants. And I thank you so much for being with me today. And I wish you the best of luck in uh, starting your seeds indoors. That is a great class, Ms. Kari. I'm getting some hearts floating up. Good job. I can see why we replayed that. It was actually from February, Ms. Uh, Janice. So um, let's see here. I thought there was a couple of questions in here. You must have answered them along the way. She has been. All right, cool. Uh, Tanya wants to know, and then we'll, we'll do this one question, what Tanya wants to know, and then we'll jump into the next presentation. Um, what is your favorite fertilizer? I'm going to ask that of Janice and of <laughs> Kari. Kari. Kari, you go first. Well, favorite fertilizer, you know, I'm going to have to say that that depends because it kind of does depend. You know, if I want to do a foliar feed, then I'm going to get a liquid like a, you know, like a seaweed extract or, a, you know, something like that. High or creations. maybe compost tea. Mm -hmm. you know? um, compost is probably my favorite fertilizer just because I can make that, you know, at home and I just put it on regularly so I don't have to fertilize as much. Um, yeah, uh, my favorite fertilizer is, you know, like an, anything natural that I can get my hands on cheaply and, <laughs> you know, that, that's not going to harm the environment, you yeah. know, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm not, I'm not really a, I don't really have any one particular thing, but I know that you have some good ones, Janice, that you that you use? Well, having taken your class, basic seed saving, or excuse me, uh, growing through the basics, I really started off with organic as like the number one requirement for my fertilizer. Organic, it's a slower uh, release. It's easier for our plants to do the uptake. It's not as burning or as harsh on, on the roots. So my way of doing um, fertilizer is I make sure that there's some mycorrhizae. If I'm starting from seed, I might sprinkle a little myco, as we like to shorten that, a little myco in the soil mix to help with the eventual roots that'll grow out. Um, definitely if I'm starting starters, but then the organic fertilizer to go along with it. And that could be uh, liquids, like if foliar feeds that uh, urban farm sells, the high creations products, or it could be a local organic fertilizer big time loving the local aspect of that and choose the one that works for you yeah you want to feed the you want to feed the soil you want to feed the bacteria and the you said mycorrhiza you know those are that's good fungi good fungi the good mm -hmm. fungus you know you want to feed that stuff not just think about feeding the plants 
right? I, I have a really quick success story. I'm, I've made some new friends here in Asheville already. Uh, one is named Sunny, and literally she lives a quarter mile away from me. Um, she heard me presenting at, a, uh, at a, uh, an event a while back, and she grew 150 apple trees from seeds. Wow. And she had just planted them when I, when I met her maybe a month and a half ago. She had just planted them in her ground. And quite honestly, I left there thinking, man, 95% of those aren't going to make it because they were struggling along. But one of the pieces of advice that I gave her was a foliar and drench feeding program. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went over there yesterday and saw her apple trees. Some of them had grown from an inch to 15 inches in a month and a half with the foliar and drench. And I asked her what she was doing. And she says, oh, I use a little kelp emulsion, a little fish emulsion. And I put it in a bucket and I threw in some other things that molasses and, you know, just things like that. The molasses feeds the mycorrhiza, by the way. Um, and I go tree by tree with a cup, just a measuring cup, and I pour a cup on each one of them as I go. And it has made all the difference in the world. It was like, whoa, check that out. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah it doesn't, doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't. Mm -mm. It doesn't. Don't forget, don't forget worm castings. You mentioned oh, compost. Yeah. That's another way to go. And that's just so easy and. Yep. And successful Gardeners and for those of you castings. that don't know worm castings is worm poop yeah worm poop call okay it calling mold. it I'm okay calling good it. let's do it perfect we're moving on bill Yay. you ready i am can i uh, i'd like to uh quote the chinese though who say that the best fertilizer is one's own shadow <laughs> oh, oh yes it. and that yes. is a great segue into seeds for extreme heat nice all yours, Bill. Let me get my... All right, does everything look okay? It's always... Yes, it does. Well, this is a topic that we'll be talking about more and more. I just read where uh, by 2030, where we are here, we'll have 18 more days of extreme heat than we already have in the summer and we had 10 more this summer than I ever remember. So it's becoming a really relevant topic for us all. Um, and, you know, it got me to think, I'm not despairing about it because just north of us here, the Hopi have been uh, for more than a thousand years in the same place, learning how to deal with heat <laughs> and have been very successful in their own way with that and growing their own food and creating a culture around it. And so, um, I look forward to the challenges. So if there's one thing that I could, um, from my own experience as we face this, um, and you'll hear us talking a lot about that, um, is find varieties that work in extreme heat. So I picked out a picture, I took a Punta Banda tomatoes. These were seeds were found um, on a tomato that escaped and had been gone wild taking care of itself reseeding year after year on the Punta Banda Peninsula in the Baja, in Baja, California. And um, it's really one of the only tomatoes that I know about that will actually set fruit in extreme heat. If you Google up or you read about tomatoes, it turns out that their um, ability to pollinate starts to wane at about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And as it gets warmer and warmer up into 90 or 100, um, the, even though the pollen, they're largely self-pollinating flowers, even though the pollen's right there, it just cooks before it can even pollinate itself. And so that's the reason why people you know, in Phoenix, if you live there, if you'll understand that during the hottest part of the summer, lots of times people don't get tomatoes. It's not that there's anything wrong with your plants or whatever, it's just too hot for them. Uh, you can work around this by getting up at five o'clock in the morning at the coolest part of the day, early in the morning, because that's when most pollination takes place, and just shaking all your little flowers so that um, pollen that is good gets to the place it needs to be early before there's any breezes or the temperature gets too hot later. And in fact, in commercial greenhouses, you'll um, lots of times they'll blow fans on flowers when the temperatures are low in order to get them to pollinate. 
But the easier uh, fix, and this is going to have to be the fix for a lot of things that we grow, is find a variety that's naturally heat tolerant, that does things even though there's extreme heat. And so Punta Banda would be an example of that. And I'm a big advocate of us as soon as we can, trying as many different kinds of varieties of all the different foods that we eat and finding those heat tolerant varieties now, especially while we still have access to seeds, you know, in eBay and overseas, all the wild, you know, diversity that's out there in the world right now as the global economy still holds together, we can access all sorts of diversity and we should. And so then the next question becomes, oh my gosh, I'm, I've, I found all these varieties, even, you know, heat tolerant tomatoes would be a huge task. How do I get the time, energy or space to grow them all out and see what works? Well, that's where I'm going to show you this is a book by Joseph Lofthouse, who um, sort of hacks into that idea and uh, talks about a system where then you would just mix all those varieties together and plant them together and just see which ones work in the heat. We could do that. He's doing this with beans. He's doing it with peppers. He's doing this with tomatoes, with all the different crops he had, with the, with the grain crops that he has. Just mix them all together don't care about what the varieties are, don't care if they actually cross and just find out what works in your extreme heat um, uh, conditions, yeah, especially as that starts to happen to us here in the Southwest. So those are a couple of hacks that I wanted to talk about. I skipped over and I wanna talk about uh, Dr. John Navazio, who's one of the lead breeders at Johnny's Selected Seeds. And so what he would add to this is go hard on them. That's what he was always telling me about, about my vegetable variety selection, okay? In other words, only save seeds for those things that really, really work well. Um, he, it is not unknown for John to throw away 90% of the seeds produced by a crop and only keep 10% or less because those are the ones that worked the very best. So in his case, in Northern Maine, what he's been working on is uh, cold tolerance because they're getting cold weather at times they're not used to and some of it's even more extremely cold. And so he's growing out huge fields of carrots and spinach and the other crops he works on and, um, and hoping and reveling in the fact that uh, many springs now, they'll have a killer frost like we had here in Arizona, 17 degrees way late in the year, and it kills everything. Well, if you go look carefully, it doesn't kill quite everything. There are a few that survive. And John would say, yes, that's what we're looking for. You know, go hard on it, kill almost all of them if you can with extreme conditions and then save the seeds from those that work better for you. And he was just last time I saw John, he was rather flippantly just mentioning that he believed that um, he had moved some of the cold tolerant crops at Johnny's 10 degrees. In other words, they're able to withstand 10 degrees cooler temperatures than they were before he got there because he's been doing this to all of their crops. So. Landry's Gardening will give you a map. If you think this is confusing or hard to understand or you don't have enough time or energy um, to be able to do it, um, Landry's Gardening is a playful way of uh, lightening your load and getting you down the road to the best results for things like extreme uh, heat tolerance. I just wanna mention a couple other things that have um, affected me about this. And that is the whole science of epigenetics. It's come a long way since Barbara McClintock won the Nobel Prize for it in the 50s. One of the first women to win a Nobel Prize and she won it for her work in epigenetics. Well, epi means beyond genetics. And what that does is shows how changes can take place in plants and be incorporated into the immediate offspring of those plants without sexual reproduction, without actually changing the genes. This is beyond genetic changes. And, uh, and they call this transgenerational stress memory in plants. And we know that plants have this. And this is, will be our key to uh, saving seeds from plants that survive in extreme heat in our own yards and planting those seeds. And then those plants we now know because of epigenetics can carry that heat tolerance that their parents experienced into the next generation. And so Dr. Bradley Tonneson is a, uh, uh, 
recent graduate with a degree in plant genetics and breeding, who's now an extension agent in New Mexico that, um, that showed me these slides the first time. He explains what epigenetics are, and we do um, uh, classes from this on time to time if you want to, or I invite you to look into it um, to understand it more. And I'm not going to go into the whole thing, but um, just understand that a plant can turn off or turn on genetic traits in its own functions in real time, say if it gets extreme heat, stress, and by rolling up its DNA or unrolling it, whatever it's doing, it can pass that rolled up or unrolled DNA onto its offspring. So you can see immediately in one generation, the effects. So if you buy your seeds from somewhere else and say you're getting them from Johnny's and say those were contract grown in China in an area you have no idea where it is or what the climate is like, and then you bring those into your own backyard the next year, um, they have, in a sense, had trans um, genetic stress happen from them to them from wherever they were. And all of a sudden, there it's freaking out here in Arizona. It's 110 degrees. Whereas if you're planting your own seeds that you saved in your own backyard from plants that survived 110 degree heat, those seeds will grow offspring that are already in a sense, understand what that's like and have their DNA primed by rolling up or unrolling it to be able to withstand that stress again. And that, I can't emphasize that enough. Two other quick little things. One, um, when you try to germinate seeds in really hot weather, they may not germinate. This is a little germination guide. Those are soil temps in green across the top and both Fahrenheit and centigrade. And um, that's kind of a um, uh, germination graph of uh, showing you when optimum germination for a plant is. And as you can see, I took this from lettuce. Um, lettuce, optimum germination is about 68 degrees. This is soil temp, this isn't air temp. Soil temp is much more um, consistent than air temp. So you have to wait till your soil warms up to 68 degrees or if you're in the desert plant before the soil temp gets above 68 degrees, because as you can see, germination starts to go down as temperatures get higher. I got this little germination guide from Johnny's Selected Seed Catalog. That's one of the reasons why I've used their seed catalog over the last 40 years. It's this handy little germination guide will give you the optimum germination temp. Then what I did was get a soil temp thermometer. And you can buy those all over. Put that the end of this thermometer in the soil about as deep as you plant your seeds and voila, you can see what the soil temp is. And in this way, you can understand, especially in extreme heat, if you're planting things and they're not germinating, you would know why. Or the reverse, if it's too cold and too early in the spring, things aren't germinating yet, you would again, understand why. So I'm gonna leave it at that and just take questions from, uh, from anyone else and uh, really welcome questions because, um, the answers that we can give you to your own particular garden questions in your own particular yard are the things that will mean the most to you. And we love those kinds of questions. So. Right. Well, I think people are still listening. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I don't know that I have any questions here. Um, actually, there's one from early on. Uh, Rosemary says, I have a list of wild seed needs. Where can I get them? <laughs> Good question. Um, to answer it intelligently, I would need to know where Rosemary lives yep. because you would want to fill it as close to where you live as you could. Okay, so look for local distributors of wild seeds. There aren't very many of them. So a way to hack into finding out where they might be is to contact your local native plant society. Almost every state has one. Somebody in there will know where to get local seeds. Um, there are very few really good wild seeds available. 
can, mm -hmm. you know, in contrast to the need for them. There are large commercial companies that grow wildflower seeds on large scale. One of them I think is called American Beauty is in Texas. Another one of my favorite ones, which is a smaller scale and I think has more consciousness around this is mm -hmm. called Applewood Seed oh, in, yes. in Littlewood, Colorado. And those people have been around for 40 years doing this kind of work. But again, you get into commercial levels. They do contract and have some, uh, some hand gathered seeds at Applewood. But when they're growing, as I said, commercially, you start getting into all sorts of other kinds of problems. And so it's better to start small and get things working in your own environment and then get keep your own seeds. In other words, if you've got a penstemon plant, which is a famous flower out west that produces all sorts of flowers, yep. uh, one, one seed would grow one plant. And from that one plant, you might get, I don't know, 50,000 seeds. <laughs> right. So you'll have enough from that on. So if you start small and over a number of years, you could actually grow a project up and learn enough to probably keep it successful. Yeah. Cool. Um, where, get, where to get Punta Banda tomato seeds? Uh, Great American Seed Ups, the only place I know of commercially in the world that has packets of it. And we sold about, how many did we sell last year, Janice? 150 or so? Yeah. I grow them. And I, yeah. whatever I end up with for the year, I take down to the Great American Seed Up. Um, you might check Seed Savers Exchange. You might try eBay. You know, eBay is actually the biggest seed exchange in the world now. I have friends that buy it. Uh, really? They were, until recently, were buying uh, pepper seed from uh, Siberia. Oh, wow. I had to go to Siberia to get seeds. And now you just get them on eBay. And last time I looked, there were still 130,000 varieties of, of packets of seeds on Amazon. Wow. You know, I always just Google first and see what comes up. So maybe somebody at a local seed library or seed exchange somewhere has them and then talked about them in the blog. Well, the Great American Seed if no longer has or, do, or temporarily out of Punta Banda. Once we get another stock, we'll put them right, back on the thing. Right. But at we, this point, we're out. Yeah, we've never had it online. It's only okay, been so at the live event. At the local event, right? Yeah. All right, it's my turn. I'm kicking you off. Okay. Woo. Gone. Right. <laughs> All, All right. right. Ms. Janice yeah. is going to talk about how to manage your seeds. I'm looking forward to this. Jump in. All right. So how to manage your seeds. This question was thrown at me to try and talk about, which is really funny because that's pretty much what I do. That's my jam is managing, organizing, getting things in a system that works. So this was kind of exciting to start talking about. Um, I want to talk to you about taking an evaluation of yourself. So first thing to do is to think about what is your style of planting? You're going to take a moment and you're going to think about this. Do you like to do your planting planning ahead of time? Are you thinking about the, um, the, the vegetables that are going to be happening, what you're going to be maybe doing for Christmas or gifts, or maybe you've got a project that you want to work on where you're going to try some growing of some grains to help make your breads that you want to make? Do you have a, a plan that's several steps out ahead of time? or do you plant kind of spur of the moment? I'm out there. I want to try and grow something. It's springtime. Let's throw some out there. It's uh, fall. Let's throw something out there. Is that there's two kind of major ends of the spectrum as to what style of planting you might be in. They're both fine. I've been both ends of the spectrum, although I tend to be more spur of the moment just because I'm so busy. These, these are going to help define what the best way to manage your seeds are. So the next thing that you're going to do is you're going to take some time and you're going to write down what your, what worked. Um, what was the, the easiest? What was the most enjoyable or most rewarding experience that you had? when you were planting seed. Take some time and think about it. You know, it, it, when you're talking about planning ahead, 
you're looking at maybe somebody who likes to plant veggies to match goals, or, you know, that's a good skill because you can do some research on stratification, which is preparing your seeds for uh, germination. Um, you might be doing some germ tests. Did you do any of that? Did it work for you? Or was it more of a hassle? And you're like, yeah, I'm not going to bother with that. It's different. And you're going to match what works for you. Um, for myself, I have had times that I've gone out and all of a sudden, <gasps> I'm running out of time. It's September. I got to get my garden in and I will just go and see what I have. And I'll just grab my seeds and I'll grab, we're out there with my granddaughter, throw them out there and see what happens. Which one is going to happen? Which one's going to work best for you? So when you're writing down what worked, um, I used to have this, <laughs> no, I've done this frequently. I would call my gardening buddy. Some of you know him, he's Ray. And I would call him in frustration. And I just have no clue because my mind has been elsewhere organizing other events and focusing on other things. I'm just like, I don't even know what's supposed to be planted right now. And I'm calling him for quick answers. He's a master gardener. I'm a master gardener. We're both supposed to know this stuff. His answer is usually like, well, you're a master gardener. You should know this. This is when my love for him gets tested. Anyways, I would be getting overwhelmed to the point that even having my handy dandy urban farm planting calendar, I wasn't looking at it right. So when I'm looking back at that, I'm going to take lessons from that. Which one of my experiences of planting something was the most fun, which was the easiest, which was, you know, rewarding from this. I'm going to try and write down those experiences in this exercise. The next step in this is to look at the challenges that you faced. Was it challenging to figure out which seeds were at the right time? Or was it more challenging to find the variety that you knew you had and you weren't sure where it was? Was it challenging to remember the spacing of your planting? Or was it more challenging to uh, remember which ones you put in which location? Different things there might be happening and they're all gonna affect which how you choose your seeds. Is it something where you want to make sure that they're, they're timing out better? Is that what your challenge is? Or is your challenge more of remembering which varieties tasted better or grew better for you in your garden? This is all stuff that if you take a moment and write it down, it's going to help you in the step of managing your seed collection. Next question, this is we're still in the self-reflection, is how do you pick the seeds that you choose to plant? Do you, do you go through your collection and think, I want just the carrots, or I, or I know that it's carrot time, so I'm going to choose carrots, or do you think that I know that it's, you know, it's a good time to plant beets, I'm going to choose beets? Is it the vegetable that directs which seeds you're going to use because maybe you're choosing ones that you like or that somebody in your family really likes? Or is it more that you're looking at the season and you're thinking, hmm, it's now tomato planting season or, you know, right about now is a great time to plant any one of my brassicas. Everybody is going to be a little bit different and it can overlap. What is working for you? So if you're going, oh, I'm going to stay on this. If you're organizing by vegetable, then probably the best part of going to be doing this is organizing your seeds alphabetically by, by seed type. Um, this is, uh, a, you know, you can categorize all your vegetables with tags. You can categorize them with, with boxes. You can categorize how you want them, but having your vegetables together by seed type is probably going to be an easy way for you if you are the type of person who is going to be working that way. If you're a spur of the moment type planter, you know, they've already answered that question first. You're not a planner, you're a spur of the moment. Then what you can do is you can add a color coding system on your, your jars or your boxes or your packets. Put a little sticker on there if you have to. And that's where you're going to put your warm season or cool season. Or if you're in Arizona, you've got like three seasons. You can do season one, season two, season three. Or you can even put 
color coding for the seasons and maybe put a little letter on there for the month that works best. That will help you when you're looking by vegetable and you're looking through, you know you want a particular carrot or a particular onion, you're color coded, you know which months are gonna work on that. If you like to plant by season, then what you can do is you can organize your seed varieties in different containers of the season. If you happen to do it my way, I happen to take some time and I've collected my seeds into um, uh, seed binders. Here we go, right here. I have a seed binder. This was a great idea that I took from one of the, the attendees of our early classes. Her name was Erin Healy. She had this binder. I've expanded on it. Um, I was selling these at the in-person event uh, just because it works so good. And I have these little divider packets that I would put them in. And they're perfect size for these uh, little uh, coin envelopes, which also are the perfect size for the business cards that come with the seed up in a box. Or you can fold your seed packets that you buy at the store in half and store them. And then I put other reference information. But the key to this for my particular style of, of referencing my seed planning, because the planting calendars that have all of the seeds at the same time, my brain just wasn't functioning that way. I wanted to have a list month by month by month which seeds would work. Now, in Arizona, in Phoenix, this is one particular calendar that's fabulous but it's not gonna work for somebody in Ohio or at Florida or Washington. Gather your own calendars, take the time and figure out what's gonna work month by month for you and put that in. If you're a spur of the moment, this is gonna be a better tool than trying to diagnose what a, a calendar is gonna look at. Your containers can be identified as well. Over here on the left, this is a container by my friend, Glenn. He is um, a by vegetable kind. So you can see right here, he's got like little turnip schedules and each one of his groups of seeds, he's got little signs for what they are. This is also small enough to throw in the refrigerator if he wants to. My friend, um, Cecilia is a, a market gardener and she uses seeds in mass because she grows enough vegetables to be bringing to the farmer's market. She throws them in old spice jars and labels them and she's got them in, in different cabinets or even on the back of the door on a shoe, wrap, uh, a shoe pouch thing. And that's how she stores them. So the containers can be different and the organization is going to work for you. The key here, I'm going back to this one here, is group them by vegetable. So you have your vegetables all together or by season. So you have all your seasons together. Either way, what we are looking at is our storage. The location should be cool, dark, and dry. That could be anywhere that you have in your back of a closet. If it stays cool, just don't do the closet next to the water heater. Um, don't do the closet next to the washroom either because sometimes that can get quite warm in there um, because heat is going to reduce the germination percentage of your seeds. You're also gonna wanna make sure that it doesn't have uh, moisture. Uh, washrooms can get very warm and very moist as the washing machine works through. Um, pantries tend to stay dry, so those are good places to store it. Refrigerators are fabulous, but if you have a large collection, then maybe you need to stage your seeds in and out of that refrigerator so that you're taking care of the cold stratification. Perennials need a, a cold period in order to jumpstart the activation inside the seeds for the ready. So perennials could use a cold month in your refrigerator before you start using them. And if you can plan ahead, great. But if you don't plan ahead and you're more spur of the moment, then maybe you want to keep a stash of perennials in your refrigerator. If you are going to put your seeds in the refrigerator for any length of time, make sure they are dry no moisture in your seeds that you put in the refrigerator, or excuse me, in the freezer. Oh, also in the refrigerator, your uh, fruit storage drawers are usually not very good because they tend to get a little moisture or they stay moist. Um, doors on the doors are usually better unless you can keep them in a, a sealed jar. So that is my section on managing your seeds. I can go into this more and I'd love to take some questions if you have them, 
but um, and this seed binder that I created, I have I packed in a lot of other information. Aaron Healy really gave me some great examples on that. Um, I throw in a local planting calendar along with my month by month and a journal so I can write down what seeds I put. So Val, you got some questions or comments? Will you marry me? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I'm, I'm already married. How about, how about, you know, boxes and boxes of, you know, tens of thousands of seeds. And I love this. Yeah. I love this because it's, this is, this is for a backyard gardener perhaps. And there's, and adapting it to, you know, larger scale. Well, yeah. that's, that's one thing that I've done yeah. is I'm taking on the management of the seeds that we use for the seed up in a box and the local seed. Um, so sometimes when I come home to look at my own collection of seeds, mm. yeah, I need to be able <laughs> to be spur of the moment. I just don't have the time to manage my own seeds and, you know, go through them to find what I want mm, sometimes. I know. Yeah. You know what I did? You know what I did last year? What'd you do? You put um, them in buckets. <laughs> no, I, well, I had them in buckets. I've stored them in buckets for a long time, That's but right. I have one. I, I went and separated them by warm season and cold season mm -hmm. and by type. So all the tomatoes are together. All right. the root crops are together. Right. All the flowers are together. Exactly. So then when I want to start, do some tomato starts, I just go uh, and open my bucket up and pull out the tomatoes and which tomatoes do I want to save and start because I have been saving tomatoes for years. Well, one of the things that I have found is that I have some seeds I have a little bit of and some seeds I have a lot of. And so how do I make sure that I've got that rotating on a good basis? See, rotation is key with the volume of seeds that we're working with at the Great American mm -hmm. Ceda. Um, I want to make sure I'm getting them in and out so that I'm not, you know, putting something in the back and forgetting about it. And then, you know, mm -hmm. decades later. Now we did talk about how long do seeds last? And that's important if you keep them in a space that is, is appropriate, then you'll be able to keep that germination process available longer. You know what I'm really excited about to dig into my seed collection. And then I know we got another one to get to. Um, I used to grow at the urban farm for probably 15, 20 years, a long stem orange Gerber daisy. Ooh, And nice. I saved, I, about a decade ago, I saved seeds and I've had them in my collection and I, they're just waiting. And now I'm, now I'm ready. Nice. I want some, I want some to take well, home. Before we end up, you know, moving on to our next topic, if there is a, if there's a, a demand for these binders, I can put two more of the inserts set together. I can put them together. It just takes a little time to, and I need to make sure that people really want it before I start doing it. Yeah, it's a great resource. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know what, on this, uh, Joni says that she ordered a seed supply from a company that was a, for long-term storage and they arrived very warm, very hot at when they mm -hmm. arrived at her house. Um, she thinks it was basically sitting on the truck for so long. And we've been hearing all the news about our poor delivery care people that are in this heated delivery trucks. Our seeds were too. Um, she says, did the, did the heat kill the seed or would you recommend that she test them for viability? What does effect does heat have on the seeds? Oh, it'll kill them. Yeah, she, she should probably germ test them. I think that would probably be a good idea. I'm also um, very intrigued on the fact that she bought a big supply of seeds, which Tell is a great, more. Great, great segue into um, the next little presentation that I have the honor of doing. But yes, she should definitely probably pry them open and uh, do some germ testing, knowing that um, there may be some casualties, but there may not be too. So yeah, just get a, get a good handle on that. And it's okay right. to open the bucket, seal it back up. There you go. Okay. Hey, All right, uh, take us muted, away. Bill. Well, it's take, Bill's take some seeds out, put five across on a paper towel, a damp paper towel, mm -hmm. five up. So you have 25 seeds in a little grid, roll it up and um, set it in a warm place. Make sure it stays damp for three or four days. It's easy to do germ tests. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would say is that seeds are the best insulation there is almost. Mm -hmm. So that if it is a bucket that may have saved you because the inside seeds may still be okay. It would only be the ones around the outside of the bucket that would be dead. 
and do some random testing from all the different areas in the bucket to check them out. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. We're going to jump in and talk about survival seed saving, right? Oh, what the heck is that? Take right. it away, Bill. All yours. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I just wanted to start by saying that um, when we create these Seed Up Saturdays, we are racking our brains to try to come up with new topics for you guys um, and, and make it broad and interesting and fascinating. And, and of course, always trying to keep in mind that we want to do basics too. And in fact, anytime you want to send us suggestions for Seed Up Saturday, we are like totally, totally up for that. That's what we're all about. So um, I'm really intrigued with survival seeds. And I don't know how many of you are aware of the survivalist or the prepper movement. Um, it's kind of hard not to know that there are certainly groups of people, and we probably have some on today, that are very concerned with what's going on in the world concerned um, locally, concerned regionally, certainly we all should be concerned worldwide. And so the idea that they could, um, uh, you know, get large collections of seeds that would provide safety is, is very important to them. And, and interestingly, the um, question from Joni about the heated seeds that she received was all about, she had bought a long-term seed supply Interestingly, people think they have to go to a long-term seed supply company to get, you know, copious amounts of seeds and, and nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, um, we are a seed company and a seed education organization. And so, um, and we did create a seed, a survival seed bundle, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. I wanted to share a story with you that kind of outlines this notion that having as many seeds as possible is going to um, help you become a safer and a more secure human being. And I, I did write a blog on this that's posted on Great American Seed Up called Guns and Seeds. Uh, we have a local mechanic here in Cornville, Arizona, really nice guy, and he is a gun dealer. So not only is he a fantastic mechanic, he's a gun dealer. And when you walk into his office and, and all politics aside, um, conversations about right, wrong, Second Amendment rights, none of that. I'm, you know, I'm just here to present some information and have a conversation with you because I am so fascinated by it. And I'm, I'm assuming that there are others that are fascinated by this idea as well. So I walk into his office and the whole right wall, the right side of his office is filled with guns on the wall. They're all displayed. And I always try to ignore them because I get a little uncomfortable with AK-47s, but, um, I also just really appreciate this man's work and who he is. And it's like, God, how, I know there's gotta be a way to connect with this guy. So I asked him about the C, about the uh, guns. And yes, of course he has a license. And, and I said, um, I said, well, you know, you have, you've got your guns, but do you have your seed, Sean? And he said, absolutely. <laughs> and I was like floored. And I said, that's fantastic. Do you know what to do with them? And he said, absolutely not. That's where you come in. And all of a sudden there was this like this palpable shift in the conversation and our relationship with each other because I had something that he needed. And of course he always has something I need because I drive a car. And so um, we, had, uh, we had a fantastic conversation. We're having, we continue to have conversations. He may even be listening today because I sent him a link to Seed Up Saturday. Uh, but the whole idea that we could actually bridge these rather disparate gaps in our communities because people have, you know, there's some fear and some an anxiety about security and safety, and that we can use seeds as miracle workers to connect us with other people is just, is such a wonderful and, and empowering idea to me. So, um, you know, the, the notion that you want to have seeds to create safety and to have security is a, is a really um, admirable idea. However, we feel strongly that unless you have a community of people around you who can save seeds, who can grow them even, and um, you know, harvest them, process them, um, enjoy the, the, the food that you're growing, if you don't have a community around you, you're sort of operating in a vacuum. 
And I think uh, one of the one of my favorite things that Bill says is, you know, um, having seeds and foods in an ocean of hungry people probably will not serve you. So I think that the whole idea of getting as many people involved in in your community in seed saving and seed growing and in um, eating and celebrating and looking at the all the different ways that that seeds bring us together is is incredibly important for our you know our survival, let alone the survival seed movement or the prepper movement. Um, so I did take some time to um, Google the topic. I wanted to see you know what was out there in terms of survival seeds or prepper seeds, and there are vast amounts of companies that have been created on this whole idea that they could um, capitalize on the instability of our society and, and sadly, um, you know, using fear as well. And uh, they are pretty, they are pretty amazing. Actually, I was like, wow, um, nowhere could I find any information about who the companies were, who are the human beings behind these companies. Um, I did see one site that said that they sourced all their seeds from this country, which can be very difficult in the modern world, especially if you're sourcing organic seeds um, or non-GMO, which is possibly another um, topic for a future uh, Seed Up Saturday. Um, so, you know, looking at these claims that are being made, looking at where the seeds come from, and looking at the companies and the people in them who are actually offering these huge vast seed supplies, I think is a really important consideration. One thing you need to know about the Great American Seed Up is we are seed people. We came into this with um, the notion that there's probably hardly anything um, as important as seeds. If you like to eat, if you want security, if you, um, you know, if you uh, think about moving forward into a very unstable world and society um, and seeds as a leveler, as you know, they level the playing field. I don't think that there's anything more important. Of course, what we offer too is tons of education. That's how we founded the organization. We always, we, um, we kind of posit ourselves as, as like the um, naturopathic doctor, the homeopathic doctor that wants to put themselves out of business. We wanna make you so resilient and so self-sufficient that you don't need us anymore. That's, and I know it sounds altruistic, but now that you've gotten to know us and, and see who we are as human beings, I, I hope that you understand that we do come to this with huge hearts and with huge commitments to try to in, improve the paradigm out there in the way that we know how, and that's working with seeds. Um, it, there's nothing wrong with having lots of seeds. Not, absolutely not, especially as we as we look at um, you know what we're what we're all up against as a safety plan. It's kind of like um, making sure you have your water supply and making sure you know um, where you can plug in your generator or if you have you know uh, backup electric or whatever. So we definitely all should look at that, and um, we just want to encourage you to consider um, the Great American Seed Ups Survival Seed Bundle. I mean, it's. We wanted to make it available and accessible. Certainly you can do your own mix and match and probably come up with a, with a combination of things that would be satisfactory to you. A lot of people like to come into this and say, I don't want the mess or the fuss or anything. Just give me my list of things that you know will do well where I am and let me order them for safety and security. So, so we have done that and um, uh, I want to encourage you to look at that. That's the survival seed bundle and consider that that might be a resource for you and share it with your community, with your neighbors, your church, your um, school and everybody else that, uh, that you can think of that would benefit from having access to these seeds. I love that so, you came up with this bundle. I just, you, the, your brainstorms and ideas have been magical for us. So thank you oh, for coming up with that. We've yeah, had a couple fun. of comments. Oh. People are enjoying your artwork on the background. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, yes, that's a, a poster of the kind of the lineage of maize of maize corn. And that was actually bought in Rocky Point, Mexico at Sado, which is the Center for the Environment, Desert and Oceans. It's a nonprofit organization. Um, that we really, really love. 
Yeah, oh, it's cool. fabulous. Yeah, thanks. Well, I'm glad people noticed. <laughs> yeah. Well, Bill's going to be coming on right now. So Bill, come on in. Um, I think that we're going to talk a little bit more about that at the very end when we talk about our new bundles. Okay, um, fantastic. But um, we're getting ready for um, Master Bill here, maybe. Hey, Bill. Don't don't make me run up to the to the house and knock on the door. Oh, there he is. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, that's not him. I'm, we're talking Hello. about the dangers of patenting. I am Dear... unable to start my video. Oh well, we'll take care of that for you. Hold on. Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, one second. There we go. All right, we're ready, Bill. I am. I think. Um. Yeah. There you go. You're going to have to um, see if I've got my. You know, we've talked about this in, in the past, the dangers of patenting, and we've given some really good information. So this is going to be kind of an update for those who have already seen this and something new for the new ones. Take it away, Bill. It looks good. Just a second here. I've got to. Oh. Let me. We had it there for a moment. I know it's not working. So let me hold, just one second. I'm going <laughs> to leave here for a second here. Well, we've got a good shot of your coffee cup and your keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can still tell us a little bit about what patenting is while you're getting everything ready. I got it now, I think. Does that look OK? Uh, I'm not seeing it yet. No, it takes a second. I hope it comes. Is it on now? Nope. No. Okay. Did you share? I see Bell. There we go. And there we go. Looks great. Take it away. All right. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about this um, introduction to it. And the reason I'm doing that is because patented seeds are showing up in our nation's uh, seed catalogs, especially in organic seed catalogs recently. Um, there's three of them across the bottom, which happen to be three of the most popular for market growers in the United States. And the, the three companies listed across the top are the companies the European companies that are supplying organic patented seed in the United States. And um, by patented, I mean you can't, for the first time in human history, there are there is a statute on the books that says you cannot save your own seeds. Uh, saving seeds has been part and parcel of agriculture since it started. And even when there have been protections for breeders to limit the amount of um, passing around of good genetic material could happen. They've always given an exemption to growers, to people that actually grow their own food, uh, to be able to save their own seeds. And patenting stops that for the first time. So it's a pretty extreme move. And in the case of Johnny's Selected Seeds Catalog, when I did my own survey, um, I found that 80% of, excuse me, 40% of the lettuce varieties, the organic, most of them organic, but 40% of the lettuce varieties um, in uh, the Johnny's 2022 catalog were indeed patented. And so you by patented, I mean, this is the same patents that you would give to software or to a new um, uh, mousetrap or some sort of engineering device that you created. Now we're allowing for the first time since 1980 because of a Supreme Court ruling to allow that to be applied to plants. And it's kind of a fuzzy, area, how do, you, um, how do you patent life? And what about the changes that happen in it? And if you allow somebody to patent a variety, you're not just patenting the seeds and that variety, you're patenting all of the seeds that all of those varieties produce for all, for at least the next you know, 22 years. It's like this outrageous restriction of something that in my own view probably shouldn't be restricted. And what gets me is that it's often hidden. As you see, this is the uh, uh, 
description of the lettuce and write out a Chinese online catalog. And you have to read down through it, utility patent granted. And they don't in that context tell you what it is at all. Here's another lettuce from a, a more recent one. And Salanova is really becoming a popular lettuce. And they, they don't say it's been patented. They just list the patent numbers at the bottom of it. And this is kind of um, frustrating because um, the way it's patented, the, the word Salanova has never been associated with it. There's just patent numbers for traits that happen to be in Sal Salanova. So it gets pretty complicated to try to figure out what's patented and what isn't. Johnny's does um, tell you what patenting means. Seeds cannot only be used for crop production. They cannot be used for seed saving, replanting, resale, giving away, or use in any breeding program. As somebody wiser than I am said once, well, what that means is you, you're not buying seeds anymore. In a sense, you're just renting them for one season in order to grow a crop. And so I wrote to Johnny's when I started seeing this and said, hey, um, I need a list. I want to know a list of all the patented varieties you sell. And they, I've done this for the last four years. Every year I get the same email back, more or less, that says no master list that contains all patented or protected varieties. They don't have one. Even of their own varieties, they don't keep it. They just don't care is what I came to understand, at least the people in their customer service department. So this is a real problem. If you run a seed library and uh, uh, you have a little sign that says uh, no patented varieties in my seed library as re required in the Russell Amendment, the re re recommended uniform seed laws that um, are recommended to state seed control officials all over the United States in order to keep seed libraries from having to be licensed. That's a whole other story. But if you're looking for a list, boy, I've never been able to find one. So, you know, I did my own. I spent hours and hours back um, testing and, and checking out the companies that actually do um, uh, sell patented seeds to Johnny's. And I came up with, uh, um, uh, there you go, 46 out of 99 or 46.5% of the lettuce varieties in the catalog I was looking at carried utility patents. And even more shocking in some ways for me is that if you try to search at the US uh, Patent and Trade Office website to find out if things are patented in R at all, in other words, like if you typed in Salanova, doesn't come up because it wasn't patented as Salmanova, Salanova, as I was saying, it was patented because of traits within it. So only 21 of the 99 lettuces that were listed in Johnny's catalog are even searchable. And so there's just no way for me um, to come up with even a close to being what I would say is a definitive list. And this isn't just Johnny's, here's a, another lettuce that's in territorials. Um, company that I ran across that is patented, and it says nothing at all about seed patenting or patents when they list this lettuce. So there's a lot of misunderstanding, even among the companies. I don't want to blame Territorial. I don't think the people that are selling them the seed are even talking about it. I think this is all part of this move to get American gardeners used to buying patented seeds before they understand that's what's happening. And when they wake up, it'll be too late. All their favorite varieties they'll find out are already patented. And if you don't think this is a serious thing, you know, um, I found the Anti-Infringement anti Bureau. This was listed on some of the companies that are actually patenting um, varieties for the American market that, that are members of uh, this new or international organization. And their mission is to make sure that um, these patents, in a sense, and other protections they put on seeds are honored. And you can see that some of the names of the companies in this enforcement bureau are the same ones I showed on the first slide. And so if you go into the AIB site and look around, you see language like this. Production, use, and trading of illegal products is an important source for financing organized crime. So they're equating people now with saving their own seeds 
with organized crime. That's how they're looking at it. Ob obviously, they're looking on a larger scale, but now these seeds are being introduced into the home market with home buyers, and they're not understanding that those seeds are patented. And so you could inadvertently be accused of organized crime. And if you think this is only international, here's a new American version of this enforcement. Enforcement Bureau. They don't call it enforcement here. They've got came up with better language, but there's an 800 number, a tip line for people to call and you can get rewards if you turn in people that are saving seeds from patented varieties. So I just think that, you know, I there it's a complicated topic. There are people writing extensively about it. I don't have time to get into it here, but I do think we need more openness, honesty, and transparency especially among our own seed dealers and seed catalogs around this issue so that we can choose whether or not we want to buy patented seeds. In Europe, they're way ahead of us. They got 80 organizations together. Um, they're in an organization they call No Patents on Seeds. They've drawn a line around. They're the, all they allow right now in Europe, and this is being um, challenged legally, but right now, um, uh, in order to be patented, it has to be genetically modified, a plant does, which they argue is really a new invention, which is the original language in the original patent act being used in the United States. But anything created out of essentially biological processes, as are all the lettuces in the Johnny's catalog, those would not be allowed to be patented. And also there's a universal in the European Union anyway, disclaimer underlying all of whatever you think a patent should be or controls or contracts with people that allows gardeners and farmers to save their own seeds, no matter what. And um, this is what uh, needs to be really clear in the United States, especially legally and is not right now. So, so uh, we started a patent-free seed campaign. Um, when we were at Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance, and you can still actually, I've, I, I've got, that's our website, seedsafe.org, but you can still sign a petition at rockymountainseeds.org until we get our own version of this up on our own website. So I'll just take questions if the, anybody has any. That is really, really good. I do have some questions for you. So um, right. Lini says, um, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, the de definition of utility. Will this stay in effect legally if there are food and seed shortages? <laughs> well, good question. I mean, a patent, the original patent act allows a patent. It goes through the patent and trade office and they have attorneys look at what you're trying to say is yours. It has to be new and it has to have utility. In other words, it has to be useful. They can't, you just can't patent stuff. It has to have show real use and utility. And so that's a great question, you know? So right. let me jump in here. One of, one of your slides had a patent number on it. And I think it was for Johnny C that listed the patent number. I wrote it down and I looked it up. Here's right. what it says. Patent wow. number, patent number 5,977,443, November 2nd, 1999 is a patent for aphid resistance in composites. That's the whole patent. Wow. Yeah. So that means anybody working as a breeder for 10 years to bring a new variety to market that happens to have aphid resistance could theoretically be sued to stop their project or to give it all to the people who own that patent. That shows you the absurdity of what's going on. I think what we need to do is have a seed class on this because this is going to take more than 15 minutes to dig into. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm of the opinion that what we need right now, I'm more of a jo Joseph Lofthausian as the book I showed a little bit earlier. We need to get as much diversity into our gardens as we can find out what works and share it as quickly and as widely as we can. I just think that the times call for that. And patenting is the opposite of that. Yeah. I think one takeaway from what you were saying is that if we in mass are doing the seed saving, then it's just going to be a little too much for the seed police to keep coming after us. That's what Jen says. So are the seed mm -hmm. police gonna come mm -hmm. to my house? 
I'm not making light of the situation. They have six years from the time, say, you would publicly announce that you're saving seeds from a patented variety to enforce their patent. So do they have the wherewithal to do that? I'll leave that up to other people. Mm -hmm. I just think, you know, this is our government. Is this the kind of policies we want in place? Is this the kind of thinking that we'll build, as Bell was talking about, a beautiful community, you know, through sharing of seeds? I mean, this is the opposite of that. And it's based on this idea that innovation cannot take place unless it's privatized. I was on a webinar for the USDA um, this past week talking about patenting. And, and I heard presenter after presenter say that. We would not be able to innovate and save humanity, the 10 billion people, and create the crops we need to create unless we have these patents. And sure, so sure. That's, a, that's a really interesting uh, way of looking at the world. I just go, God, all the stuff you have to work with was developed over 10,000 years by humans who had no idea what um, breeding was about, but just saved their own seeds and created things that they liked to eat where they were. And you're saying there's no innovation? Our entire food system was innovated by people who had no patents and no idea what they were doing. And so yeah. it's kind of a specious argument. And we'll leave it at that. Yeah. So we're wrapping this up now. We're going to go ahead and give you some information uh, that's pretty important. Uh, one of the things that Bill talked about was our survival seed bundle. This is the brand new bundle that we've put on the website. It is um, a collection where we've already picked out 30 of the seeds that are the ones that we were looking for if maybe, you know, it got really bad and, this, and the supply chain was interrupted. What is it that we'd want to have in our own supply? So mm -hmm. this is your way to do it. And there's, it, we decided on this to be able to have something that is going to be mostly for storage. So if you're storing this, you don't need the extra plastic bags. So you get 30 varieties, um, a basic seed saving book, no extra plastic bags. This is an excellent gift for somebody who's starting out and maybe starting to start their food storage or uh, just trying to prep for maybe a, a to-go box or a to-go bag, here's a, the bundle that you would wanna put with that for anybody who's gonna to wanna to start being ready for an emergency situation, okay? Um, if you already have them, that's okay, but if you don't, this is a good place to start. Um, we also have the Baker's Bundle. This is the one we've been promoting all week. It is our mini bundle, seven different varieties of grains, um, 70 generous portions. We do have two new grains that we are in the process of getting into our system. They're not quite there yet, but for now, this is what you got. Um, if, we, if we run into a situation, we might sneak one of those in if we have to, but this is what we have. We've got Durham, Einkorn, White Sonora, Cereal Rye, Emmer, Red Fife, and Spelt. Okay. And there's, um, this weekend, we've waived the minimum purchase requirement so that you can go ahead and get this because this is less than our normal minimum requirement. Anybody who buys seed up in the box from last Wednesday to next Wednesday, through August 31st, I'm gonna go through the system and we're gonna go ahead and send you Death by Tomatoes, um, a PDF booklet. Um, Bill, did you write that? I think you did. Um, Death by Tomatoes. I did, yeah. A seed saving guide for growing delicious tomatoes. So I, I a, came up. I came up with the title, though. <laughs> <laughs> we're not surprised. <laughs> One of my favorite things to do. <laughs> we're not surprised. We also have an offer for the Never Buy Seeds online course. Bill, Bell, this is your like masterpiece putting online for seed school, basically. Um, we're going to have it 50% off. If you do this, you just go to neverbuyseeds.com. Use the discount code SEED. Um, this is a great gift for those that you know who are trying to start. You know, maybe you have uh, a family member who is um, struggling with one thing or another, and you know that they want to start their own garden. Throw this at them and say, you know what? Here is a gift to get you started. Show your support without having to go do their gardening for them. 
there was a question about saving seeds in their backyard, Annie, and um, if they were, if she's allowed to do them, do they produce blah, blah, blah. And it's like, Ooh, get on our website. There you go. This Enjoy will be never buy seeds that just the resources, the information, you know, those, those questions are very far reaching, but we have lots of answers for people. Right. So we're wrapping it up on time, Bill, Greg, we did it on time. I'm still answering a couple questions. Good. Um, let's see. Jen says, if you place seeds when the soil temp is too high, will they eventually sprout when the temp comes down? Bill, that might be for you, Kari. Or have they been ruined by being in the, in the soil for that time? That depends. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes they will. Yeah. Sometimes they'll surprise you and come up when they feel like it. Uh, that might not even be till, you know, the, the next, next year. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's happened to me before. Yeah. Or sometimes they'll just come up a little bit later than you thought they would. Uh, yeah. There's, there's no telling. They'll Wait, come when up they do, when, uh, when they do save them, right? Those are the ones you want. Right. You've gone hard on them. Only one came up and it came up years later. You know, those, that's your volunteer. That's what you want. That's what you want to select for. That's a then, great point. Then you won't have that trouble in the future. It'll carry that characteristic forward. Um, Lini says, if you plan on seeding outdoors and the temperatures are not cooperating, what can be done to optimize seed germination in the soil? She used to grow seeds around St. Patty's Day in Ohio, but it's been too cold and too wet for them to be direct sown. So, um, oops, Greg did something that moved. Um, and then there's hot temps in the early springs and the lettuce bolts quickly. Can anything be done? Who's got questions on that, answers on that? You know, the long answer or the, the one that would take the longest amount of time to answer it is to keep planting plant early, plant all the way through. And again, those plants that make it, that have more natural adaptations to the conditions that are actually happening to you now, those are the ones you wanna save the seeds from and build a crop that's resilient to what's happening to yourself. I mean, there's lots of little tricks. My father used to dig a foot long, uh, foot deep um, furrow in his garden about three weeks earlier than we would normally plant corn. Too cold and wet. He would just plant and he would put, he literally saran wrap over the top of it and plant his corn in the bottom of it almost a month early. And so it was like a little greenhouse and it would come up in that little greenhouse. If there's frost, it was down in there and protected. And then it would, about the time it hit the, uh, the saran wrap and start to push it off, um, it would be about the time to plant your corn normally. So we got a head start. That, you know? That's funny because I was going to say that my grandfather did a very similar thing. Yeah. yeah. You know, people have been working on yeah. this stuff. That, uh, this is the folk wisdom, you know, that I love. Yeah, sure. And, and, and when I lived in Kansas as a young person, we used to put uh, clear plastic down on the foil early in the spring just to get the soil warm and and we'd put the seeds in and as soon as they started to sprout then we'd have to take the plastic off because it was too heavy you know you couldn't you couldn't have your seedlings under it but yeah you can you can try all these tricks and do, use all these tricks which is great or you can go the other route and just keep planting until something works and then you know latch on to that and repeat it uh, then you don't have to use the tricks as much. <laughs> Whereas yeah. Joseph Lofthouse would say, if it never works for you, maybe you shouldn't be growing it. Find something that will work, you know? Right. There's one more so, thing you can do with seed up in the box seeds. Grow sprouts. Just do oh, a sprout yeah, yeah. tray. Grow, grow the little minis. And eat the little minis. They're so, they still have all the super nutrition in them because they haven't expended it all. It's all fresh. But save enough of them so that you grow them out so you can save the seeds. So Annie did put an interesting question in here. She said, I went to the website and looked at the seed varieties in the bundle. Many of them I would not grow. I didn't want to purchase seeds that I would not grow. Well, you can Tetris your own bundle. 
You can make up your own bundle, pick the varieties that you would want to grow and buy those. And even if you're not gonna to wanna to grow them because it's not a vegetable that you're interested in, they make good gifts. Hey, there you go. Huey asks if we ship to Canada. Yes, Huey, we do. Um, we do have international shipping costs that, are, that do um, become part of the bundle and we don't ship grasses. So the cereal rye is definitely not an option. Um, at this point, we haven't had any problems with the grains, but you know, at some point somebody may say something different about the grains, but the rest of them have all been able to get through the uh, uh, customs without customs. a problem. Cool, cool. Wow. Well, we answered all the questions today. Another yeah. great event, another fantastic event. Right. Great American Seed Up. For those of you who are local, we are having an in-person event in Phoenix, November 4th and 5th. You can go to the website and you can choose if times on Friday or Saturday to come join us in person. And this is not the big 10 person bundles. This is the individual scoops. And you'll get to see all of us there too. Somebody asked if we were, if I was gonna do a seat up here uh, in North Carolina. And um, it takes a lot of work, probably not gonna do a seat up here. A lot of supplies. Um, Cause for our great American seat up in Phoenix, we'll have a um, hundred varieties, maybe 90 varieties of seeds that all go in popcorn buckets that people come and scoop. And we need all the business cards that go into the bundles and so on. There's and so a on. huge warehouse of supplies that we need to have for what exactly. we do. However, you can do your own, buy your own seed up in a bundle. We've had several people buy several thousand dollars worth of seeds so that they can do their own seed up. Bubba, remember maybe, Bubba down in Texas? Yeah, well, maybe you need to do a mini seed up, Greg, just not the big one. There you go. Except and don't. Don't Thank we you. still have the little um, instruction booklet that we include about? Yes, we oh, yeah. do. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. And yeah. Greg will have to have to, you know, he needs somebody out there to come help him manage it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm done. Anybody else have anything important? Uh, Last minute Lee thoughts? says, Lee says, have you checked for interest in different locations? Um, there's interest everywhere for this and it's just capacity for us to do it. Hence the reason we made up the seed up in a box. Do your own. It's everything along with instructions is everything you need to do to get 10, nine of your friends together and do your own. If you are interested in doing a seed up, a real seed up where you have an event and you have the signage, just contact me. We can, we can get you the um, PDFs so that you can make your own signs. Yeah, that's cool. It's super simple. All right, guys. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Bill and Bell and Kari and Janice. Thank you. And Thanks, you guys. It's always a pleasure. You guys are amazing. Total Thank pleasure. You. Thank you. What fun. We'll talk soon. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.